welcome everybody to the November 21st City of Boulder Planning Board meeting. We've got everybody here tonight, so I'll call the meeting to order. Um, so first, just a note, we've uh, made a change to the agenda. There was a mistake in the way we'd put it together before. Um, there was an item that was listed as a public hearing item. It's actually a call up or a continuation from last time, which is the SNARF's uh, site and use review. So for those of you who are interested in speaking to us about the SNARF's site and use review, there won't be an opportunity to do that under the public hearing because there isn't a public hearing for it. But you can speak to us under public participation, which is the next thing after the approval of minutes. Um, and then just so you know, like the public participation part of that is closed. We can't really consider your comments as a part of our uh, remaining um, conversation. So um, we have one um, set of meeting minutes in front of us tonight, October 17th, 2019. Uh, I think there were a few changes made by email. Does anyone want to make any further changes or maybe make a motion? I'll make a motion. Oh, do you want to do it, John? Go ahead. Okay. Then I move that we approve the is it October 17th minutes? Did yep. you say? Yeah, the October 17th planning board minutes. I second. Great. Anyone have anything to say about that or should we call the question? Seeing nothing. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Those pass unanimously. So now <clears throat> is the time for you to speak to us and sign up with Cindy, the board secretary, if you would like to speak to us about anything, including the SNARF's um, continuation or anything else that's on your mind that's not our public hearing item, which is a uh, ADU co-op ordinance uh, modification to the land use code. So we've got two folks signed up. Um, the first one is Mary Hay, and you guys can go ahead and kind of approach and then uh, get in line, with, although we only have two of you. Um, and the second one is uh, James Cadolf. Um, so uh, Mary, you're first, and the way it works is you got three minutes. Um, there's three little lights there. Uh, the green one means go, the yellow one means you're getting close, That's and the right. red one means that you should be done. Yes. So, and you gotta start off by giving us your name and address. All right, Th thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mary Hay. I live on Grove Street in Boulder, uh, uh, one block from this proposed restaurant. Um, I am here to support the staff recommendation that this not be granted, um, that it is a, that there's not a compelling reason to override the comp plan, and that the uh, the site review, uh, I don't the site here that says uh, not to take away housing. Um, I just want to be clear. We, this is the third time this has come up for the neighbors. Um, I wrote a letter about it in 2012 when it first came up. There was a 1440 square foot coffee house, which was then expanded to 2275. Then that became the favored number in 2017. Like a zombie, it came forward again <laughs> uh, after being rejected and was rejected again. And so this is the third iteration. It's difficult for us to keep I mean, I had to scurry around to try, where are the papers from that <laughs> episode of life? <laughs> but in any case, um, so we do support um, the, the staff recommendation. The second part is that the parking uh, assumptions, I think, are just wrong. And, and I know that they, they pay the parking uh, survey group, but it, con it contradicts our lived experience in Gosgrove. I've lived in Gosgrove for over 40 years. and. It's not true that these spaces are available. They're not available on 19th Street, south of Arapaho, and on Grove Street, to say that there are 15 or 20 spaces available during the day between 18th and 20th is simply not true. It's hard to argue against this because you've got these stats, and I don't know what day they rode around. I started, the guy at the fly shop and I both started to go around and look and count spaces and so forth, but, um, we found that, I mean, one thing I found that at the SNARFs now, I went and there were seven parking spaces for this much smaller space. They were all full. And the, the guy at the fly shop went too. He said, well, they're all full all the time. With a larger shop, it's just, there's not going to be parking. It is going to be pressed into our neighborhood, which it doesn't exist, it's gonna be pressed further, but this is a central issue. We, we worked very hard to get the NPP program because we couldn't park at all prior to it. And now that we have it for Goss Grove, which also includes Arapahoe, we have Arapahoe cars parking on the street there too. So i uh, just like you to really drive by and look at the parking situation. <laughs> 
Thank you. Great, thanks, Mary. Uh, next up is um, James Cadolf. I'm sorry, I'm getting your name probably wrong. You got it. Got it? Sweet, never mind. <laughs> Uh, good evening, my name is James Kadolf. I'm a law student at the University of Colorado and I live at 4458 Hamilton Court, which is right next to Table Mesa Station. Uh, members of the Planning Board, the City Council election over the past few months, a major issue came up in of the uh, inclusionary <coughs> zoning, excuse me, the inclusionary housing policies of this board, in particular, the cash and lieu exception was cited by over half of the, of the city council candidates as something that may need to be revisited. And I'm gonna to speak to the board today about how that should not be revisited and how the board has done an excellent job in creating an innovative and exceptional cash and loose system. In support of that, I'm gonna bring two major points. The first that uh, Boulder affordable housing is roughly the same as surrounding counties despite significant barriers otherwise. And second, that there are potential problems if the cash and loose system were to be completely gotten rid of, as some have <coughs> uh, proposed, or if there was going to be a major modification. So uh, to that first point, uh, according to HUD statistics compiled by the Assisted Housing Initiative, uh, those among us who need affordable housing the most, extremely low income renters or ELI renters, uh, experience uh, roughly the same amount of per capita housing opportunities in Boulder as they do in surrounding counties. And that's despite a spike of housing prices in Boulder and a substantial volume of, of those people, those important people here in Boulder as well. And uh, furthermore, the cash and loose system in Boulder has been addressed by both the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and Grounded Solutions Network to be an innovative and effective program at creating opportunities for uh, groups who know affordable housing and have expertise to use money gathered by cash and lieu uh, to apply those resources to people who need them the most. And uh, to my second point, there are potential problems with getting rid of cash and lieu uh, that some may have proposed in the past. Uh, Bloomberg economist Noah Smith identified the primary of my concerns, that being that if we were to get rid of cash and lieu and mandate all uh, affordable housing to occur on site, that that could lead to a potential decrease in growth here in the city of Boulder. And when you combine a lack of growth with the needs of this city and how much it is burgeoning and growing, uh, that is a very dangerous combination. It may impinge on the need of affordable renters even more if cash and lieu was gotten rid of. Uh, so for those reasons, I urge the board uh, to be very careful and for any modifications made to cash and lieu to be based on solid statistical evidence and policy uh, rather than political impulse. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks very much. Anyone else, Cindy? No. We're good? Okay. Great, so we'll move into the discussion of dispositions, planning board co-ops and continuations. Apologies, we didn't know you were over there doing that. Um, okay. Um, uh, give us a sec before you start. Don't Sorry, start me yet. No. <laughs> no. I haven't hit the button. Okay, good. <laughs> I need every microsecond. Okay. Um, first of all, I support Anlu because precisely we need to stop put on the brakes in Boulder. Lynn, we know who you are, but can we get your Oh, Lynn Siegel, uh, Mountain Heights. Yeah. Okay, um, now, I was thinking, what do I talk about tonight? But you reminded me, snarfs. I wanted to bring up ADUs because if I'm to put an ADU on my space, then why should I? When I can only have three unrelateds, unless I can get a family person with their kids in my house, and that means their, one of their family members has to live in the outside building and the first primary family member has to live in the house with me. What the hey? Why do I wanna do an ADU? I thought you're, t you're trying to support including more, getting more housing. I have one out there, but I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna throw money at it for, without, without reason. You need to get more people, okay? 
Th this is like an ethnicity deal, you know? Just because we're blood related, that's friggin' ridiculous. I'm sorry for Plan Boulder, John, or George. I forget. It's so many it's John. Okay, anyway, so, so, so that's my take on ADUs, okay? So OSO at 311, and this is gonna come up with South Boulder floodplain. And it's South Boulder floodplain, not CU South, okay? And that is, David Gear told me yesterday that, well, if, if it's okay at 311, there's some extra space that they gave us for, you know, um, up on the, along the ditch, like that that's an excuse that, that, that we, they can encroach on the OSO for building B at 311. That is violation of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan. I'm sorry. I asked our attorney, you know, because I expected a legal answer, but he just reminded me of what I already knew. So you need to do something about this. Also, they're digging up at 311 around the tower, which was hotly disputed, and they just demoed part of one of the landmarked cottages up there. Big problem. Okay, now let's go to Snarfs. <laughs> God, three friggin' minutes, okay? Snarfs needs to be landmarked as the only affordable housing left in for CU and CU's uh, um, impact on Boulder for housing. And if you wanna say, oh, it was commercial before, now it's residential. Now we can just turn it back to commercial again. Well, listen to this gal that was here that said it's impacting her parking. And listen to the fact, look at 21st and Pearl, which was community benefit and is now gonna be office space where the people can live right across the street in the high-end condos. Problems in paradise. Lynn, I'm speaking as the conscience of Boulder. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, so now we'll move to, unless we have anyone else signing up, Cindy, we're good? Okay, great. <clears throat> um, move to discussion of dispositions, planning board co-ops and continuations. We've got um, one uh, call up, which is a non-conforming use review for modifications to an existing legal non-conforming duplex at 524 18th Street. Does anyone wanna ask any questions or talk about that at all, John? Uh, I'd just like to ask a question. Your mic. I, I'd like to ask a question of staff on that. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, pieces of correspondence we received from a neighbor was uh, expressing concern about potential damage to a, a uh, sewage pipe that, that flows under a portion of land that might be used for parking. And I just wondered, what is the responsibility of the landowner not to damage a, a sewage pipe for which there's an easement under a, another person's property. Because I, I didn't see that, that dealing with that was one of the proposed conditions of staff. If you could just give us a second to pull up the email. So we only have very limited information available on this, but if this is a sewer line that's serving a neighboring property, it's either that there might be information in the easement um, on, on damages and so forth that occur with work that occurs on the property that might determine the liability issues, but it seems generally likely that the person who causes the damage would then be responsible for fixing it. Well, I, <coughs> I, I guess, I, I would rather not call this up if, if, it's, if there's a clear uh, 
determination of responsibilities, but the the neighbor indicated that he was concerned that a, you know some heavy truck might be parking on top of his sewer line and thus crushing it. But you can imagine there's all kinds of potential finger pointing if there ever were to be a problem. And I'm just wondering if there's there's any way that that this might be dealt with right now. Uh, Maybe to rephrase John's question is if, if he were to call it up under the use review criteria, would, would we have a way of dealing with that issue? Put a fine there. point on it. <laughs> Here to help. <laughs> I'm just wondering um, <clears throat> the uh, if we did call it up, that might give the owner of the 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 gentleman who wrote in, who's concerned, an opportunity to at least speak with the um, new land, the new homeowner, and talk it through, maybe resolve it before. They go forward. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying we should call it up, but I'm just trying to think about. Uh, I don't know if we would have a role in that. I mean, they, they, that opportunity, I think, would exist or not exist, it's totally independent of the board's authority. Um, I don't know for sure about this one, but sometimes in the past we found out that while there are things that we want to consider on a call up, um, if the criteria that are in front of us for that, like use review or non-conforming use review um, or expansion of a non-conforming use review, um, there's really explicit criteria for that. And so we can't really say like, oh, you've got to deal with that other thing also. So if we call it up, often Who'd if it's not part of the content, we just can't do anything about it anyways. So where would um, the, a, a homeowner, where might he be able to turn? I think the neighbors should talk to each other, probably, or, or then talk to the city. I mean, the city. This board doesn't do everything. It's, right, no, no, you know, I understand. I'm just, it's worth raising. So, you know, I'm looking at the site plan. I don't see that there's a survey in the packet. And so, John, there are three parking spaces on sheet A1 in this, this site plan for the residents. It looks like one may be inside the structure and two are outside. Yeah, I... I it's the other way around. That's a structure and that's an entity. Okay. So somehow there's a... There, this There's another parcel off-site that has an easement across next this parcel. Neighbor. All I know is that the next-door neighbor has written saying that he has an easement for his sewage mm -hmm. line going under part of this land. Right. And he's concerned about potential damage mm -hmm. to that line. And so it, my point is just that it needs to be clear what sort of responsibility each mm -hmm. party has for maintenance and potential replacement no, just if there's damage. Yeah, I'm, yeah, easement language is where you'd find that for sure. I think that's probably a civil matter for the, the two to deal with, with between each other. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if this applicant has a property right sitting on top of this easement, the sewer easement probably says it's a sewer easement. It probably recognizes that it runs underneath his parking facility. and. Well, That's in, interesting just to see yeah. how staff perceives it. No, it's yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, uh, potentially I can imagine there's some limitation th that there can't be construction on top of that that would prevent well, access, but see. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we couldn't see in the in the packet where the sewer line is located. Generally, there is a restriction in the code on building a structure in another person's private easement. Um, so I suspect that maybe the sewer line is underneath just the surface parking that's proposed on the lot. Um, that's the only thing that makes sense. But otherwise, what the code does um, protect is that no structure can be built in a private easement unless the city can determine that that's allowed under the easement terms or there's consent from the property owner. And that's not 
that's part of um, the general requirements in Title IX. It's not really part of the use review. So it wouldn't be part of the review that you guys would be doing if you called it up. But it would be part of building permitting. Yes. They would review for that stuff at that point in time. So, so it's not an issue that we can actually have any not impact on. Review. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Good questions, though. Thank you, John. <clears throat> and thanks, everybody, for giving some time for staff to yeah. come up with a good question on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good answer, rather. Um, so then we'll move to um, item 4B on our agenda, which is a continuation from our November 7th meeting, um, consideration of a site and use review, LUR 2019-00042 um, for the Snarf Sandwich Shop. Um, I believe we have... Um, yeah, we just have some brief staff. remarks. So um, good evening, members of the board. As um, the chair mentioned, on November 7th, uh, the board directed staff to go back and draft conditions of approval and some approval findings based on the board's discussion from that evening. So we've prepared that. We've included that in your packet. Um, I think what we're asking the board to do tonight is to consider the findings of fact that we uh, prepared for you for a recommendation of approval and then also to consider the proposed conditions of approval and discussion as to whether or not um, those are adequate. Great. Thanks, Charles, appreciate it. So um, if everyone's had a chance to uh, read through that and give it some thought, um, basically our process is gonna be to go ahead and um, take action or not take action or do our deliberations right now. So if anyone has, if anyone has any questions of staff, we can maybe start off with that. Is that a question, Sarah? No, or do you just I want to kick off? I have a condition I'd like to raise, but I'll wait until. Okay, yeah, yeah feel free to go ahead and kick it off, I think. Okay, and I, I want to thank Hella for helping me identify where to find this. So this was an issue, a condition, a proposed condition that I raised at the hearing whenever it was, a week or two ago, um, regarding um, <clears throat> the management plan. And uh, it just struck me that um, we had just heard the uh, management plan, the use review for PICAs. And they were trying to be very thoughtful of their residential neighbors and uh, closing off the uh, um, outside music at 9 p.m. Um, and it struck me that um, uh, the management plan for this proposal does not offer the same um, <clears throat> kindness to its uh, residential neighbors. And I, f I feel that under 9-2-15 E3, which is um, compatibility concerns, um, that it would be reasonable to request a condition that um, music stop being played at 9 p.m. Um, every day that the, the every day, I mean, it's open seven days a week, so that, that would be my condition. Great, anyone wanna talk about that? And just to clarify, you mean outdoor music? Outdoor music, yeah. No, they can have no music at all. No, just outdoor music. <laughs> I, I think that's a very good idea. I agree with that. Other thoughts? I agree too. I would be fine with that. Peter, Harmon, chiming in or no? Yeah, I didn't think there was going to be any music. We asked Mr. Mr. Snarfs. About, it actually said about, in the proposal outdoor. Yeah. <laughs> His answer was, I make sandwiches. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which is not the same thing as no music. It's uh, answering a different question. <laughs> okay, is everyone, uh, like, just sort of quick straw poll? I think everybody basically said yes. Are we kind of cool with that? Okay, great. Um, does anyone want to make a motion on this? I'll make the motion, okay. if you'd like. <laughs> Would you like me to awesome. read it first? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. I thought we're done with the word is. And it, see, uh, now you can make whatever motion you want. She's committed, so. I'm committed. Um, I move that uh, uh, the, the planning board approve the site and use reviews under case number LUR 2019-00042, subject to the recommended conditions of approval found in the November 22nd. Uh, 21st, 2019 staff memorandum adapting, <clears throat> adopting the findings of fact incorporated into the November 21st, 2019 staff memorandum and uh, uh, adding uh, an additional condition uh, that outdoor music be uh, uh, stopped at 9 p.m. as part of the uh, Good Neighbor Plan, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. Operation yeah. Agreement. Yeah. 
now I can second it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Does anyone want to speak to this motion, or should we nope. take action? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and call the question. All in favor, aye. All right. Aye. aye. Okay. Passes unanimously. Thank you guys for helping us um, sort through the language on that. That was a good process. Do you guys want a couple minutes to change over? No, we're good. Gabby and I are gonna swap out. And okay. Because we could take like two hours if you want and come back. Yeah. Pete is like. <laughs> Okay, so our next agenda item um, is a public hearing and recommendation to city, or potential recommendation to city council on an ordinance amending Title IX land use code to clarify ADU standards, including ADU occupancy standards, and to update the roof pitch standards for the detached ADUs greater than 20 feet to be greater, like modify the height to be greater than 20 feet and up to 25 feet in height to allow the conversion of existing accessory buildings to ADUs. And we'll follow the normal um, public hearing process on this. We'll have a presentation from staff. Planning board can ask them some questions. Um, we'll then have a presentation, uh, or not, no presentation from the applicant because there's nobody applying for this. Um, we'll take a public hearing comments at that point in time, and then we'll return the matter to the board for deliberations. So, staff, take it away. Good evening, board members. Um, some or all of you might recall that in February of 20. 19, um, the latest updated accessory dwelling unit regulations went into effect. Um, the ADU regs have been in place for a number of years, but they were, um, they did go through a kind of a holistic um, rewrite uh, in 2018 uh, with, with February being the implementation date. Um, so since that time, we've been monitoring the applications that have been coming in and, and seeing how effective it is. And, during the course of that time, we've found some ambiguities in that code and some cleanups and clarifications that are necessary. Um, so that's the ordinance that's before you tonight. We're calling it a, a code cleanup and update <laughs> ordinance. Uh, and Andrew Collins is gonna walk you through that ordinance. Yep, good evening board, I'm Andrew Collins. Uh, the purpose of tonight's item is for planning board to make a recommendation to city council on the ordinance amending subsection 964A accessory units to modify the roof pitch standards for existing legal accessory structures that are converted to an accessory dwelling unit and to clarify the existing ADU standards along with related details. So the proposed updates to the ADU regulations uh, would do four things. Number one, they would allow for an administrative modification to the roof pitch ratio standard for legally existing accessory structures convert into a detached ADU that has over 20 feet in height. It would limit the architectural design consistency requirement uh, for detached ADUs to only new construction. It would also add language that would uh, clarify or state that cooperative housing units and ADUs cannot be located on the same lot. And then clarify the occupancy of dwelling units and ADU code language and related definitions. So the intent of the ADU regulations has been to foster additional housing choice in the form of ADUs, including the conversion, again, of legally existing accessory structures into detached ADUs. As Carl mentioned, the ordinance, ADU ordinance was adopted by council in December of last year and went to effect in February of 2019. Uh, again, we've identified some ambiguities and unanticipated situations such as um, some barriers in the code to allow the conversions of legally existing structure, accessory structures to ADUs, and also the ambiguity that may exist uh, between allowing ADUs and co-ops on the same property. Uh, the intent of the ordinance, as Carl mentions, is for cleanups and limited updates uh, to the code. So the first two uh, updates are to the ADU design standards. Mm -hmm. Uh, currently, the legally existing access accessory structures may not be able to uh, reasonably convert to a detached accessory dwelling unit when the existing structure conflicts with the AD design standards. Specifically, there's a roof pitch ratio requirement of eight to 12 or greater uh, for structures that are 20 feet or taller. And we've had some instances where there's been uh, legally existing structures that have a, a lesser roof pitch. And then secondly, we also um, are proposing to change the architectural uh, design consistency standard, which requires the ADU to be consistent architecturally with the existing residents or with adjacent buildings along the side, yard, lot lines. And so while this may be appropriate for uh, new structures being built, 
it represents a barrier that could be uh, cost prohibitive if you have to adjust your roof line or your roof pitch or do some other architectural facade uh, redesign of your existing building. So we're, we're proposing uh, two things to address these. One, allowing modifications, the roof pitch height requirement for legally existing ex accessory structures only uh, that meet the requirements and are not increasing their overall height or size. And then clarifying that the uh, detached accessory drawing unit architectural design standards applies to new construction only. Uh, on the left of the screen, we have an example of a legally existing accessory structure that doesn't meet the roof pitch ratio requirement. Again, eight to 12, so eight feet vertically to 12 feet from the center point out horizontally. In this case, the um, accessory structure is 22 feet in height, but only has a six to 12 or lesser uh, roof pitch and wouldn't be able or eligible to convert to a detached accessory dwelling unit to try and remedy these types of situations. The third proposed change is re in regards to uh, cooperative housing units and ADUs on the same property. Uh, this was not a scenario anticipated at the time the co-op housing or the ADU regulations went into place in 2017 and 2018 respectively. Uh, as such, the code doesn't currently expressly indicate whether an ADU or co-op can be on the same uh, property. So there's some ambiguities there and there um, has been some concern there could be some unintended impacts to neighborhoods um, if they were to develop uh, concurrently on the same lot or property. Um, certainly, um, we're open to hearing other suggestions as well, but our proposed code change initially is to expressly prohibit having both a co-op and an ADU on the same lot or property. <laughs> the fourth change, uh, proposed change, relates to the ADU occupancy language. This is a clarification. There's um, some inconsistent terminology across sections 963 accessory units and then in 985, the occupancy of, of dwelling units as well as the definitions. Uh, it, switch, it shifts at points between persons and rumors in an inconsistent manner um, as well as not consistent with how um, it's been implemented. Um, so staff is proposing a code change to simply align the language of persons and rumors in a consistent fashion across the sections and add a new definition of rumors to the code, which is not there today, and then clarify the accessory dwelling unit definition as well. Uh, this proposed code change would not impact the number of occupants allowed. Uh, that would not change as from what it is today. Also want to point out um, the most recent draft of the proposed ordinance is in attachment A in your packet. The memo itself contains some older draft language, so I would refer to attachment A um, as we move forward. In terms of public feedback, we have published notices in the planning newsletter. Uh, we talked to potential applicants and pre-applicants about the potential updates. We have received some recent emails uh, to the planning board, including from the uh, Boulder Community Housing Association, um, expressing their support for allowing ADUs and co-ops to exist on the same lot of property, uh, opposed to the initial staff recommendation uh, to prohibit such a scenario. So our, our staff recommendation for planning boards to make the following motion on the screen uh, to recommend that city council approve the ordinance as generally found in attachment A to update the ADU standards. And just really quickly, next steps. This is scheduled for a first reading at council on December 3rd and a public hearing and second reading on December, December 17th. We do have also the um, detailed uh, code language on additional slides if you wanna see that. And so we'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks Andrew. Questions, so we got, we all start at the end, David and then Sarah. Okay, yeah, with regards to the uh, cooperative housing uh, uh, situation, um, <clears throat> I saw the, uh, you know, the concern about unintended consequences. Do we have any more information about what some of those concerns might be or where, where they might be coming from? Because uh, I just couldn't quite figure out sure. what those might be. It would be, I think, stemming from an intensity standpoint and just it wasn't necessarily something that was thought through previously. So concerns about ownership, questions regarding uh, ownership of the co-op versus the ADU. There's different parking requirements for ADUs and, and co-ops. Um, so I think in our initial thinking it was a loophole that may exist. And so our initial recommendation was to uh, simply prohibit those two from existing, but we're open to additional feedback. Is there any um, occupancy? Uh, I mean, the, the overall lot has uh, occupancy <coughs> limit for um, a co-op versus a, um, a non-co-op uh, situation, those apply to the entire lot, right? So that wouldn't change whether, whether there's an ADU or not. I 
think we would say yes, but I would defer to. I'm just kidding. Well, yeah. yeah, I think when I think there's been one pre-op where where this has been proposed and we've discussed it, and that's where we would have landed. That the the overall occupancy limits for um, for the co-ops would apply to the entire lot, but it's not expressly addressed in the code. And and one thing that's a little bit odd about the construct is that co-ops are approved by license, they're still considered a dwelling unit under the land use code. So it's it's just kind of a weird inter interpretation exercise. Okay. Thank and you. then and part of that was also, I think in this particular pre-op, what was proposed was a co-op in the main house, but mm. the ADU not to be part of the co-op. Yeah, that would be uh, a, a, another kind of thing I would be interested in is whether it was, it had to do with whether the ADU was considered part of the co-op. Okay. Thank you. Cool, Sarah? Yeah, just some clarification. I found the persons versus rumors uh, quite confusing. Uh, and I didn't see a definition for rumors. And rumors is not actually an English word, as far as I can tell. Um, so uh, I mean, it may be for the purposes of our for BRC. But um, so can you just unpack that a bit more for me? And um, because I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me either what the term rumors meant or whether the change you were proposing made it any clearer. Sure, let me sure. just jump in on that too, actually, Andrew, before yeah. you go, because I, I mean, I, I had the same question, mm -hmm. and I guess uh, why not simply just replace the word rumors with persons and not have a subclass of people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to, I mean, I would defer to, I think, how on this one, but we're proposing a new rumor definition based upon a uh, definition of a rooming unit in the building code. And so that's geared more towards um, students uh, living in a different arrangement. And so with the ADU occupancy standards, um, it al I think it allows two additional um, rumors, but we've been, been interpreting that as two additional persons. So we're realigning that language to say, uh, plus up to two additional persons. And then if you have a rumor, then you'd be subject to these additional requirements um, here. But the, as I read it, and I, I might very well have read it wrong, um, an individual, a person constitutes uh, either a person or multiple related people. Is that correct? That's, that's what I thought I read. In the accessory dwelling unit standards, it makes a specification that only applies in that section that persons means a person or any of their dependents. It's only applicable to that section and not elsewhere in the code. But so what does that mean in terms of, uh, um, I realize you said it doesn't change the total number of people who can um, live in that dwelling unit, but it also wasn't wildly clear. So um, uh, I, I don't have the language right in front of me, but um, uh, I mean, to, to uh, Brian's point, m maybe instead of calling them I mean, a rumor is a renter. That's really what you're describing as a, someone who's renting the ADU. Is that not accurate? So, so rumor was the term that currently exists okay. in the occupancy standards. And when this came through last time for ADU changes, we discussed it quite a bit on, on how staff interpreted the occupancy standards. And it has been interpreted as 985A1 allows one family plus two persons. Um, not just rumors, and with regard to the ADU standards, I think especially Harmon brought up that, that that's very confusing, and if we interpret it as persons, why don't we just say person? So we're implementing that here by changing it to person, but there is an additional sentence that creates a floor area restrictions for rumor uses, and it used to be that there was or your rooming unit, rooming unit use in the code. It's no longer really acknowledged, but there are still, still some out there. Um, and I think that's what it relates back to. So we didn't want to take that floor area limitation out of here, but we wanted to make clear that we interpret the uh, occupation, the occupancy standards as 985A1 allows a family plus two persons. So does the rumors, the second sentence, quarters that rumors use shall not exceed, does that refer to 
what we used to call OD, the, the internal ADUs? No, it's, it's kind of fun. It's an old use that used to be in the code, and I think that that was more common back in the day where students would rent just individual rooms mm -hmm. without actually also using the kitchen and so forth. And we wanted to, and, and part of the interpretation of the occupancy standards and the intent of the ADU changes that were adopted were to allow the people that were gonna be allowed within a dwelling unit to be placed in either the ADU or the, um, the principal dwelling unit as the occupants of the, of the lot wished. And rumors seem to tie it and yeah. put it into the main house. And, and persons opens that up a little bit more, which is already how staff had interpreted it anyways, but this just makes it a little bit clearer. And, and we are proposing um, a definition for rumors. Okay. Um, and, and it's based on the rooming unit definition and, and talks about that it's the renting of rooms um, and may include a bathroom, but doesn't have a kitchen. And the, um, under A1, the up to two additional persons, persons in this case are individuals or people, yes. individuals and associated family members? Um, persons is individuals and then for an ADU, the language states, for an ADU it says in an, we look at the whole property as one. The occupancy standards apply as if it was just one dwelling unit. Um, however, you can look at 985 and all the persons that are allowed in there may be on the property in the ADU or in the principal dwelling units and any of their dependents. So if you can have a family plus two people who are unrelated, those are the two persons and then if there's an ADU on the property, anybody who is a dependent to any of those people, those two unrelated individuals or any of the family members, they would be part of the family already anyways, I guess, they would also be allowed on the property. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, I appreciate the clarification, thank you. Is everyone feel, feeling crystal clear on that? Mm -hmm. Great. John, a question? Yeah. Uh, Two questions. The first uh, is to get some clarification on the design, uh, uh, the design character that fits in with uh, existing <laughs> home and neighborhood design character. It it sounds. I'm I'm trying to understand what that actually implies in terms of objective definitions of design. Is is there an objective way of of knowing whether the design is consistent with existing housing design, or is that a subjective determination of staff? It's a subjective determination through the ADU process. I mean, in general, the criteria were created to create a gr the greatest level of compatibility between structures in, in a neighborhood. And we so generally when we get these applications, we look at kind of the form of it or the, the, the color, the materials, just make sure that it fits in as long as that determination can be made, it can be approved. Um, it, it, but it doesn't have any specific criteria um, related to design. Right, well that's, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear that. But what I am trying to understand is why it doesn't consist, why it's only applied to new construction uh, rather than any changes that would result in a in an ADU, I mean, it's proposed to apply to new construction because that's the opportunity where it can use or take echoes from other buildings around it to to fit in. Um, whereas an existing structure may or may not have been designed to be compatible, and in order to not create a barrier to converting an existing building, um, that's why the suggested change is being made. So has this issue come up in some of the projects that you've been dealing with? Uh, Several times. Those times. Uh-huh. I see. And, the, okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, the, the other question I had is maybe more for Hella than, uh, than the others, and that is we received some correspondence talking about uh, issues 
particularly in Lyons, I think, where people have, have effectively subdivided lots between an ADU and, uh, and the main dwelling by creating an HOA and, and uh, selling parts of uh, an ADU through the HOA. And I'm just wondering, is, is that something that could happen in Boulder under the existing uh, regulations? Um, I've, I've looked at our ADU regulations and I think it might be possible to set it up that way. Um, it would have to be very cleverly drafted and it would not change any of the requirements that exist under the ADA regulations. So all of the requirements that apply to ADA, AD, ADU still would, would still have to be met. There would still be the size limitations that apply to the ADU. The two units would be tied together in terms of occupancy because we look at the occupancy of the entire lot at that point in time. Um, it would still have to be the principal residence of an owner of record of the lot, and it would be subject, for example, to just having single utility lines and so forth, and units wouldn't have their own utility lines. So I don't know that it, it's something that would be attractive to be created. Do you see any need for, uh, for us to consider that and decide explicitly whether we, we want those sorts of developments to happen or not? Well, we, we are not aware that that, that has occurred in Boulder. Well, I, my point is whether we want those to occur in Boulder or not before, before we're faced with, the, with somebody applying for that. Um, I think maybe not. I mean, it's 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 probably a political call, and I, I don't think we have seen any. All of the standards of the ADU regulations will continue to apply. Um, yeah, I don't. And then there are, there are restrictions under state law with regard to condominiumization. Um, you can't prohibit a property from being condominiumized and you can't impose requirements on a property um, that is condominiumized that are not applied to a property that is a different form of ownership. So that limits what the city can do and I think it's, it's mostly requirements as currently already exist that, that can disincentivize that kind of structure. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a comment also, um, and maybe this will spur some conversation. I'm reading the email that Holly Rogan sent us on the 19th, and under uh, heading a few facts, the first bullet says to turn a property into condos, the property owner must simply form an HOA and file the necessary forms with the assessor's office. It costs about $20,000 to do so. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that I don't know where you get the number 20,000, but also don't know, um, this is making it seem a little easy because you have to file a condo map. Mm -hmm. You actually have to have a survey that creates different ownership parcels. And that certainly doesn't just get filed with the assessor and the city gets to approve or deny that condo map. So, you know, I think we'd probably want a little bit more information than what we've gotten it might be where it might be worth um, suggesting to city council when this when the ADU thing comes to them to ask some questions for staff to explore maybe so we it do get more information might be a yeah. separate tendril than this whole topic I mean it's more I'd, something that staff can research and give us yeah input on later. I don't I don't think this is something we'll decide now I think right. uh, uh, I, we can talk about it among ourselves in the <coughs> discussion section but I think uh, staff's input is very interesting and useful here. So, mm -hmm. and I, I do see that it's desirable to consider this before we're faced with the actual issue, rather than waiting, waiting for uh, someone to, to do it, and then we have to figure out how we respond. And I also point out that the second bullet says there's no mechanism to alert the town that someone has condoized their property. To discover them, one must search the assessor's website and again, the condo map has to be approved by the municipality, so that's, that's the method to... Um, the, the city of Boulder does not approve condominium maps. 
we usually are not aware when somebody communalizes. Mm. Because the, the other jurisdictions in Boulder County, uh, at least uh, Lafayette and Louisville do. So, you know, maybe that's one way of, of looking at it as having a, a backstop of city approval of condo maps. And, and the examples that were attached to the emails, um, they were subdivision requirements for, for condominiums. Mm -hmm. um, but if it was required here, it probably would be, would have to be required in, in all of the other circumstances as well, the creation of townhomes and uh, condos and in multifamily dwellings and so forth. And the city does have no involvement in that at this point in time. Yeah, from an anti-discrimination perspective, yeah. Well, I don't know why you would create a subdivision process just for this particular scenario, but not other condominiums. Yeah. Other um, salient questions before we hear from the public? Pretty good? Okay, great. We'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Oh, we have a bunch. Great, we got a whole bunch. We'll be more excited that way. We got, um, so I'm gonna call you guys up three at a time and you guys can come and stand up and get in line so it goes a little quicker. Or sit in the front row, we have three empty seats. Yep, pack the front row. Um, and so you guys all probably know the routine sort of, since you heard it before, but you get three minutes, the green light means go, yellow means you're almost out of time, and red means you should stop talking. So first one up is Rob Ross, then we got David, David Edmondson and Claudia hansen Theme. Thank When you start talking, she'll hit the button. <laughs> Sorry. So I guess in you reality, green super familiar with the, it. Yeah, the green will go when you go. It's <laughs> uh, okay. a good pregnant pause, though. I like it. Dramatic. Um, my name is Rob Ross. I live at 2605 Mapleton Avenue. I'm an architect and one of the owners at Trad Design Build here in Boulder, and I wanted to discuss the subjective language related to architectural design for deta detached ADUs, which states, architectural design shall be consistent with the existing residence on the site or adjacent buildings along the side yard or side lot. I'm aware that this has been in the ADU code for years, though given the review, now seems like a good time to have the language removed. Um, I've spoken with a number of other architects. I've had clients um, that were unaware of this architectural design requirement, and they also felt the language is subjective and should be removed. Neither accessory nor principal buildings have architectural design limitations like this. For the most part, remaining design standard language that applies to ADUs is more consistent with the zoning code form bulk standards. Although these other design standards do create limitations, they can be applied fairly universally and are not subjective. As for ADU architecture fitting with the principal buildings and neighboring structures, we should think about the character of the existing housing stock or how new remodels in those areas are changing neighborhood character and how that will influence the design. Or split level homes with 11 inch siding or brick ranches, what inspires homeowners or those of us in the design profession to come up with something new? I don't think so. When I walk down alleys in our neighborhoods, the architecture often does inspire, at least me. Uh, the variety of character from historic garages to modern accessory buildings to funky sheds and DIY chicken coops. The alleys have always been a place for beautiful and experimental architecture. When we build small, it often frees up resources or opportunities to do something different, something unique. So I request that the reference to architectural design be struck from this ordinance. It has no place in the regulation of our backyards. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Um, so next up is David Adamson, then Claudia Hansen theme and then Lincoln Miller. Good evening. David Adamson, 815 North Street, and uh, I'm the Executive Director of Goose Creek Community Land, Land Trust, and I'm the other uh, expert co-op housing organization. And I would, um, despite their great intelligence and wisdom, I'd like to oppose the staff recommendation. I've been very involved in helping to develop more co-ops. We've had little traction in this um, much debated subject, and the barriers to developing co-ops are already considerable. And we're not talking about occupancy. Um, there's no occupancy impact of allowing an ADU in a co-op, but 
that I can tell. And I can understand our pre-app was the one that um, I think uh, surfaced this issue, and I think the concern about what was going to be part of the co-op or not is, is an important one. You know, our basic idea was it would be part of the co-op, but it adds very important flexibility for folks who are going to live in a co-op. You know, that extra kitchen, that extra living space, maybe that's right for a family. They're part of the co-op, but they need a little extra um, privacy at times, and or for an uh, older couple or or whatever. The the, the ability for a co-op of any any type, uh, a, a private equity co-op, a rental co-op, or um, a low-income co-op, to have an ADU is an important element of flexibility, and that's what we're trying to do in this town, is get on board with dealing with the real crisis we have with income inequality and with housing. So we don't want to add restrictions to the co-op ordinance, which was done to provide more flexibility, help more middle-income people, help more families. So. I, I would be very disappointed if we went with the staff recommendation in this case. As a co-op developer and as someone who's seen many other co-ops in an attempt to form, I, I just don't see, I think cleaning up is always a good idea, <laughs> as my wife kind of uh, often recommends. <laughs> but in this case, I think it can be done in a way that has little, um, that, that uh, is in sync with the intent of the existing uh, co-op ordinance and of ADUs. Um, I, I made a point there that the co-op should be able to be have within a, an attached st structure, the ADU should be able to be of any size. Again, that's just an element of flexibility. I don't know if you want to deal with that tonight, but it doesn't really matter. The occupancy is going to be the same, and it's an, a part of the over-regulation that we have in this town that, that, um, that frustrates the kind of flexibility that's needed when groups are coming together and trying to accommodate a structure to their needs. Finally, I'd just um, like to um, similarly just make the point about the roof pitch issue. You know, this is over-regulation. I have a modern house myself, and the, uh, the existing uh, accessory unit has a pitched roof, but I want to make it a flat roof. So, you know, m let's reduce the regulation of people trying to create diverse living situations. Thank you. Great. Thanks, David. Uh, Claudia Henson theme, Lincoln Miller, and then Alana Wilson. Good evening. My name is Claudia Hansen Thiem. I live in Boulder, and I'm speaking tonight on behalf of the Boulder Community Housing Association, or BOCHA, which is a group founded in 2013 to support and advocate for diverse forms of community living. Members of BOCHA were surprised to see language related to co-ops amongst the suggested revisions to this ADU ordinance. And we're disappointed that staff is suggesting additional restrictions on these forms of housing that support so many of Boulder's stated goals. So the staff memo suggests that co-locating co-ops and ADUs would, quote, likely generate additional impacts to neighborhoods that were not intended. And to be honest, we're not sure what those impacts could be. Indeed, we don't think there's anything about allowing an ADU on a property that necessarily overrides elements of the co-op ordinance that were put in place to safeguard nearby neighbors. Co-op occupancy limits are set at 12 persons in low-density residential zones, and staff may have other interpretations, but we see no reason that adding an ADU would change this limit. It would simply change how people are distributed on an existing lot. The co-op ordinance also mandates strict limits on resident parking, Regardless of size, co-ops must limit on-street parking to three cars, and again, this requirement would not change with the presence of an ADU. We know that occupancy limits and parking are major concerns in the community, but we simply don't see how combining co-ops and ADUs would change these impacts. Meanwhile, we think there are good reasons to allow these two types of housing together. David spoke to some of them. First, doing so um, would expand the number of properties available for community living. Only a small fraction of existing Boulder homes are suitable for co-op occupation, so including homes with ADUs preserves flexibility for people trying to organize them. A second benefit of co-op and ADU combinations, and this is one that I personally find the most compelling, is that semi-private living actually opens up shared housing to a broader cross-section of our community. Currently living in a co-op house requires an intense commitment to sharing space, and this typically attracts young adults, single people, and others who are comfortable in group settings. 
but the economic and social benefits of community living are also attractive to families with children, older adults, and people who simply desire more privacy in their day-to-day -day lives, and ADUs provide this option for them. With both the co-op and ADU ordinances, Boulder sought to increase the availability of affordable and environmentally friendly housing types in the city. And for our part, we can say that housing cooperatives already provide exceptional benefit for this community. They disproportionately serve low-income workers. They have small per capita environmental footprints. So allowing for their pairing with ADUs will make them easier to create and more accessible and, tra and attractive to more members of our community. Thank you. Thanks, Claudia. So Lincoln Miller, then Alana Wilson, and Amy Haywood. <coughs> <coughs> Good evening, Lincoln Miller, uh, Boulder Housing Coalition, also Boulder resident. Um, so I also uh, am staff for an organization that is, quote, an expert cooperative housing organization, or ECHO, under the new cooperative housing ordinance. So we have reviewed uh, and looked at all of the uh, applicants that have received a license under the new cooperative housing ordinance. Um, and we're, we're just not seeing the things that were described, um, additional impacts. Um, we're not seeing any ADUs and co-ops um, coming together so far in any of the applications. So there doesn't appear to be an existing problem with ADUs and co-ops. Uh, but what I can tell you, uh, as the Boulder Housing Coalition staff person, is that we have a property, Chrysalis, uh, that's been around since the 90s. Um, it has a detached cottage. Uh, it's a fourplex, uh, grandfathered in fourplex uh, with 16 occupants. It doesn't use the co-op ordinance or the ADU ordinance, but it has an effective ADU building that has been used to support low-income families um, and single parents for more than two decades. Uh, folks have lived in that building and been part of the community, uh, and it's worked for small families. There's a single parent living in there right now. Uh, in addition, at the uh, Ostara Cooperative, what we've seen is, uh, well, let me describe that building real quick. It's got eight units, six of which is a rooming house, two of which are retained as attached two-bedroom units. Those units, are functioning like ADUs and co-ops could together, and they have two single parent families with five children in them, and they're very affordable. Uh, and they've been in existence for 20, since 2013. So what we see in the real world of co-op development is functional ADUs and co-ops working out together very well. Um, so I'd like you to consider uh, allowing co-ops and ADUs to be together. Um, I mean, and I guess the final thing that I wanna say is every time we work to make things more restrictive, uh, we limit our choices. And what that does is it puts upward pressure on every square inch of land in all the single family homes, and it increases the odds that every one of those homes is gonna be scraped, and the biggest mansion that can be built is gonna be built. We need to be more flexible and more nimble, not more restrictive. Thank you for your consideration. Thanks, Lincoln. Alana Wilson, Amy Haywood, and then Emily Wingear. Hi there, I'm Elena Wilson. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. I live at 748 10th Street, which is the Pickle Brick Co-op. Um, I've been at Pickle Brick for two and a half years, and I previously spent five years living at the Chrysalis Co-op, which uh, Lincoln mentioned is part of the Boulder Housing Coalition. Um, I'm here to just convey a little bit of what that personal experience was like, living in a house, Chrysalis, which had both the cottage-like ADU space that Lincoln described and also a basement unit that was sort of functioned as a separate apartment. Um, I lived with two single moms in my time there, the first of whom had two kids, and she chose to live at our co-op, um, both for the community, but also so that she could put her infant in a sling on the front and then hold her four-year-old daughter's hands and walk across Spruce Street to the daycare and deliver her daughter before she went to work. Um, the second single mom that I lived with um, was a teacher and lived at the co-op 
in the apartment to have her own space or in the cottage to have her own space, but also to have the built-in childcare that came with having 14 other adult roommates. Um, so that combination was really beautiful and really functional for people who like a typical or like a third until co-op that I'm in now wouldn't work for. Um, and so I just, I really strongly encourage you to consider continuing to allow that for future co-ops, for future families in Boulder. Um, and the other thing that I just wanna reiterate is that co-ops are awesome. Like they're a really, really amazing form of housing. They're how I've afforded to stay in Boulder and live where I work. Um, they provide built-in like community and social structure and um, responsibilities that are distributed equitably across everybody sharing the home space. And um, we use a fraction of the energy, water, natural gas resources that other households use on a per capita basis. So they're directly in line with the, all of the sustainability goals that we have as a city. And the best part is that I'm gonna go home at 7.30 and dinner is gonna be on the table. I didn't have to cook it and I'm not gonna have to clean up after it because my cooking shift is not until Sunday. And if you, anybody want, ever wants to come have dinner with us, we have family dinners five nights a week and would love to host you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> dinner offers. Um, Amy Haywood, Emily Wingear, and then Lynn Siegel. I think that might be a quid pro quo. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> There's only two of the three, I think. <laughs> Amy Haywood, 2075 Upland Avenue. Um, I was just gonna read the action list written in the 2019 draft for amending the land use code. And it stresses simplifying current regulations, modifying the saturation requirement to increase it, providing flexibility and limits to unit size, removing and modifying the parking requirement, and exploring location-specific implementation. Um, in our neighborhood, it's um, a combination of old ranches and square block new kind of cement modern construction. So often throughout Boulder, you do not see architectural uniformity. So I think trying to imply that on ADUs is just not practical because there isn't existing <laughs> uniformity as, it's, as it now exists. Um, I think that, it, I don't know how you decide if you don't have a code, but there aren't that many ADUs getting constructed, and so if you had a board that went and helped design codes that would be appropriate to a certain neighborhood or to an ADU that wants to be constructed, that maybe you could help inform um, some design aspects that a homeowner could implement. Uh, I don't think it would require that much time or staff to do that. Um, I think just in general, and it's for my own benefit also, that I would legalize all pre-existing ADUs that are illegal because I think we are providing an amazing um, low-income housing source for the city, which is really important. And I think ultimately we need to, instead of discouraging shared spaces, encourage shared spaces. Sharing resources is very important to combating global warming and also loneliness that is one of the greatest suicide factor or factors in suicide. And I think that when people live in community, people are watching out for them and helping each other and it's, it's really important. And the alternative is already by right that you can build a 6,000 square foot home, that the large big developers are getting everything they want, but the alternatives are not provided for other people in Boulder. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Uh, Emily Wingear, and then Lynn Siegel, and then Court, Kurt Nordbeck. And if that's the last person who signed up, if anyone else wants to sign up, this is the time to do it. Okay, so I, have, I wanna echo some things. Um, the ADUs help with the income disparity and the housing crisis, and also traffic problems. Sorry, can you say your name for us too? I, Oh, I probably got it wrong. He's but just said it, look, but it's Emily Wingeyer. Wingeyer, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so ADUs help with um, the income disparities, um, the housing crisis, and the traffic problems because people can live in Boulder more easily rather than having to commute into Boulder where there are so many businesses and not enough housing for the people who work at the businesses. And also, um, 
I want to um, propose that where we put more people in a house, we could maybe get RTD to help out by creating an EcoPass system for these places, because if we're going to have limited cars, which I think is a good idea, then maybe we can provide alternative transportation and promote that aspect of our culture in Boulder. Um, I would like to have more liberal rules for ADUs so that we can use more empty rooms in houses. There have been a lot of huge houses go up, and then when the people leave Boulder, then it's hard to get three people who can afford to, to, to actually pay the rent on those huge places, so we have empty space. I think we should increase the number from three unrelated people to, to something that is more like a ratio of the rooms available or the square footage available so that we don't have so much empty space that people can't afford to use. Um, you know, I think, you know, not everybody is a college student, so it doesn't really apply to the problem on the hill. You know, there are like places in North Boulder, you know, huge mansions on Upland that are sometimes empty. Um, so I think reducing the regulations for di to encourage red diver diverse living situations is a smart thing to address all these problems I've mentioned before. Um, I agree with allowing co-ops to have ADUs. Everything they said, I just want to second the motion, third it, fourth it. I grew up in a co-op. Uh, you know, I'm 60 years old, and my dad was a minister. My mom was a Sunday school manager. You know what I mean? Um, Christian education. So, I mean, it's that he was a seminary professor, and it's like, you know, it's not just hippies, you know? Um, he, so, okay. Um, let's see, encourage them in existing houses. Um, let's see, said all that. Uh, yes, and then I'm, I think it's really important, I'm a conservationist, to conserve resources instead of using all of these natural resources to build more places. If we have all these empty places, you know, it's like we need to protect the planet, you know, so there's so much that goes on that's waste in building when we have enough that we could fill. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Lynn Siegel and then Kurt Nordbeck. Lynn Siegel, Mountain Heights. I just realized when I saw your room pitches, all this time that I thought I could have an ADU, when I've had 17 people at my house at one time, until, Airbnb, until the city regulations came down on me. No complaints, seven years, you know, on the edge of Mapleton Hill, 17 people, no problem, okay? Would be a problem probably if every house wanted to do that, you know, but just saying, you know, the person's <laughs> responsible. Um, the roof, the roof pitch I thought on my outbuilding was apparently it's it's a lo it's a four probably so I would have been screwed thinking I had an ADU potential ADU uh, but like I said I don't know if I want to put an ADU on there because why got three people in my 1800 foot house which is way too big already anyway and and yet Dan Caruso you know has got 16,000 square feet for three people like she said What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> you know, like, so, um, I mean, Marpa House, I recommended to Robbie's group here, the landmarks that should be landmarked as the culture that it was. 40 years on the hill, 40 people, completely efficient use of the space. You look in 100 years from now and you're gonna see ratios of how many people to a kitchen and how many people to a bathroom. You know the balsam now? Four bedrooms, four bathrooms. What do people do all day? Sit in their bathroom all day? <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, th th they can do it, you know, but they need constraints and they need impacts because in that 20 bathrooms in the same plot of land as I have two and a half bathrooms, you know, that's a lot of friggin' infrastructure, isn't it? <laughs> you know, so like other folks have said, I mean, I'm not telling you anything new here. It's like so obvious. But the kibbutz, I guess they aren't happening in Israel anymore. I don't know why. Because Marpa House is great. The, the culture, the, and you know, now it's gonna be a frat house, right? And look at how the speculation happened with there. Started with three million bucks, the neighborhood went in, 4.2, but there was a balloon payment, and John Cobb with Shambhala, with all the costs from the sex scandal, he had to put in for 
Look at that speculation, 3 million to 4.9. We got a housing problem in Boulder and we gotta do something about it. And yes, we have a constrained blue line, but at the same time, why are we building friggin' apartments all over this place? Micro apartments, ELUs, nuh uh, no. Put on the brakes. Thanks, Lynn. Balance jobs, housing. Appreciate it. Last one up is Kurt Nordbeck. Hi, Kurt Nordbeck, 777 Delwood Avenue. I uh, happen to be the treasurer of the Boulder Housing Coalition, but I'm speaking tonight just for myself. As other people have said, it seems like, well, I'm t talking about the combination of co-ops and ADUs, mm -hmm. and it seems like uh, the proposed uh, restriction seems intended to mitigate harms that are imaginary, but will cause harms that are real. The occupancy limits and parking restrictions are unchanged by the existence of an ADU, but prohibiting an ADU further restricts property options for co-ops and reduces the flexibility of living arrangements. So I would request, I, I think it makes it, uh, all the sense in the world to clarify the ordinance. And so I would request that you recommend some language to the effect that a property with a co-op license is allowed to have an ADU with occupancy limits and parking requirements as determined by the normal co-op rules. So I'd encourage you to include verbiage to that, to that effect. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Kurt. Okay, um, so do we have one more? No, all done? Okay, great, cool. I thought you were saying like, no, I can't keep, keep going. I was like, oh no, but I wanna keep going. Um, so we'll return to the matter of the board now. Um, do we have key issues up here or do we not have a slide for that? What motion language? Uh, let's go back to um, the four topics. Yeah, may as well take it in order of those four topics. Does that seem all right with everybody? Sure. It's a way of structuring our conversation. John, do you wanna kick us off? You look eager. Sure. <laughs> um, on, on this issue, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have more comments with other yeah. ones. But on this one, I, I wonder why we need to have the uh, the roof pitch requirement when we already, when we, at the same time we are having the architectural design standard uh, character, uh, which would seem to me to deal with the roof pitch concerns, at least from an aesthetic point of view. Is, do I understand that correctly? Well, both of those are current uh, requirements um, of the code. To, so for a new structure, they would be required to build eight to 12 roof pitch, they were 20 feet or greater, and have an architectural design consistent with the residents of the site. Um, so this is proposed code change is geared toward removing a barrier to existing accessory, accessory structures are trying to convert, but their existing roof pitch um, can't meet that requirement. And so maybe it cost prohibitive to change a roof form or renovate the architectural style to match the house. And so in an effort to encourage more potential conversions to detached ADUs, we're proposing a modification process to help uh, alleviate that. Um, but those two design criteria, roof pitch and the des design, would still be in place for new construction. So my question is, why do we need that roof pitch criterion? Mm -hmm. I think one thing, thing to point out is these requirements, I believe go all the way back to when the ADU regs were originally implemented, which I think is in the 90s. And one thing to point out is accessory structures are limited to 20 feet in height. So I think when doing these regulations, they were trying to create like a carriage house that would be in the backyard, like that would have a gable roof pitch. So it actually allows up to 25 feet, which is over a typical accessory structure. So it just kind of put those limitations to encourage that gable roof form. You could go to 25. With if you form. were yeah. creating a fairy tale looking carriage house, right? Not to go flat. Yeah. Okay. So they're just two separate issues. I think. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm grateful for that explanation, but I'm just wondering if the architectural design standard already addresses that uh, factor. Is it? If it's aesthetics that we're thinking about. I think essentially what this 
the first part. I, I see where you're going, and I actually agree with what you're heading towards, I think, is that part of what this does is essentially modifies the height limit from 20 to 25 feet if you got a gable roof that's steep. Um, and just from my perspective on this topic, both of these things, I was pretty vocal about this. The first time we went through this, and also just because it's been in the code for a long time doesn't necessarily mean that it is um, good. Um, and uh, we've got a lot, of, a lot of examples in the code that are historic and really pretty poorly thought out, um, which is why we're doing good, doing good, good uh, code updates. Um, so for me, I think, you know, even the um, uh, federal historic uh, district design guidelines don't require compatibility in this kind of sense where you would be matching materials, um, matching roof forms. It's actually a super antiquated way of thinking about compatibility. Um, it's conformity, not complement complementary design. And so I, I totally agree with um, Rob, what you said, um, that uh, the alleys are a place where you actually do get some kind of interesting, looser things happening. And if the alley doesn't match this street, if you were to walk around the entire thing, I don't think you experience a personal affront when you do that. You've walked, you know, 150 feet, 80 feet, and 120 feet, and you go, oh my God, the other side of this doesn't, doesn't look the same. I don't think that's a problem. Um, so I honestly think that the, the whole architectural design standard component is something we should be getting rid of. I guess I'm next. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I don't have as much heartburn about the roof pitch issue, but the um, architectural compatibility piece, you know, if we were Santa Fe and we had districts that were all Adobe, I wouldn't want to see a brick colonial ADU. You know, and if, if we were, you know, if, if we had any kind of anything but eclecticism in Boulder, I think <laughs> it would be sensible <laughs> to think about some sort of compatibility but, um, but as long as we've got the eclecticism, which every neighborhood does, um, we, we ought to embrace it. And it's maybe an old uh, code provision that has outlived whatever usefulness it had in the first place. David? Um, okay, so I, first of all, I want to thank you for putting up a picture of what the roof pitches look like because I, I was actually almost going to send an email out to ask for that. So thank you for doing that because that helped me visualize what's going on. Um, I wanted, I just wanted to say that um, I agree with a, a lot of what's being said. These are, um, this is a very minor update that's meant to uh, help uh, ease the situation for um, existing uh, legal uh, ADUs. And so, um, while I would uh, uh, welcome the idea to maybe uh, make a statement on whether additional loosening or you know whether we should examine the architectural standards, um, I don't want to uh, uh, lose the opportunity also to support what you know this change is as well. So I just want to make sure to voice support for this change, and then we can talk about whether we might want to recommend something additional. It seems to me that that. Uh, I don't know if, you, if if people are thinking that it would go into this ordinance or maybe a future ordinance. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Don't want to lose lose these because I think these are good. Yeah, just to clarify before I call on you, Lupita, and then Peter. I mean, my suggestion would actually be to get rid of the DADU architectural design standards, but keep the ability to increase the height limit to get a gable roof that's steeper because I think that's a pretty effective uh, way of trying to encourage that roof form, which people seem to like sometimes. So Lupita and then Peter. Yeah, so I, I think of the pitched roof, and I really wasn't, wasn't thinking about how pretty it looks. I was really thinking about snow loads. As an engineer, I was thinking, it probably was designed to make sure that they can withstand the weight of the load of, of the snow that may be collected in this part of the, of the country. So um, it seems like that might not be the case, but I would like to make sure, because uh, to me, these things should not be arbitrary, and even if it though is being kind of presumed that it is arbitrary, I would like to at least have a reassurance that there's no engineering design behind this that we just mm -hmm. disregarding just because we don't understand it. So that will be my two part. I, I can provide a little clarity on that myself, just because we do a lot of snow country design on with buildings, and current um, snowology is that you actually try to hold the snow on the roof as opposed to shedding it. There's whole systems out there of um, you know, snow ladders and snow cleats to try to keep the snow on the roof. So 
Actually, that's the, it's actually the opposite. In snowy climates, you keep it on the roof. Safer, because otherwise you end up with a huge accumulation around the perimeter of the building that causes uh, uh, snow melt and water infiltration in the building, and it also causes a lot of like um, safety hazards. Yes to one, no to two. And there are some instances where the ADUs look better than the homes around. So oftentimes it's not a hard. Can I ask a question? Um, you're saying no to two, but doesn't two just say that the architectural design standards that currently apply to all ADUs, whether they exist today or not, Thank you. Strike. Are going to only be applied to uh, new ones. So okay, I got uh, it. Modify. So if we said no to it, they would um, actually apply to old ones. Come on, you. Yes, sir. Clarify. Number two should read: Clarify that the Dadu Architectural Design Standard doesn't apply at all. <laughs> that's. that's I, I would land in that situation for sure. John, you want to take another? Yeah. Uh, I. I may not have been. I don't think I stated my opinion on that. Um, I think that the. When I asked how the architectural design standard is, is used, because there's no objective basis, it depends on the judgment of staff. Frankly, I'm, I'm willing to live with that. I have faith in staff's ability to encourage an applicant to, to, do, to, to prevent it from being outstandingly ugly, which is, which is the- Yeah, I would agree. Standard. That's what I was going to so say. Just don't I, let it be I'm, ugly. <laughs> Actually, you, know, you can there, still there do it outstandingly ugly, and pardon? you can still very much do it outstandingly ugly. Oh yeah, but I mean, follow those design standards. In fact, sometimes you're obligated to do it <laughs> outstandingly ugly because of the existing building. Well, that's actually the heart of the problem with the. I guess the my point is, there's no objective basis for determining the architectural design standard. We're asking staff to exert their influence to the degree possible, and I, I think that's appropriate. I would think, I mean, I'm not trying to get into too much of a debate with you on it. I think just advancing the conversation, I don't really feel like the, um, it's not a question of not trusting staff. I actually think that that's a pretty reasonable thing to be putting into our code, ask staff to address stuff like that. But um, I think we're just sending them on the wrong track by saying that the ADU needs to match the house um, because the house next door doesn't match the house and it's still the streetscape's okay. Um, and the, the, I'm super familiar with these design standards, and they, they typically drive you towards trying to match siding or color or window patterning, roof pitch, stuff like that. Um, but in actuality, if you go through a lot of the alleys in town, you'll have a Victorian brick house at the front and then a flat roofed, um, like one, one slope shed style um, carriage house in the back or garage in the back. So. It's not even a historically accurate requirement. Lupita's jumped out of her seat. Yeah, um, with regards to how often do you say no to any of those combinations? Has there's, this happened? Is this a regular problem? There's actually been quite a few, and I think what we're running into are kind of typical um, mid-century modern ranch homes and a desire to build something a little bit more modern and sleek with maybe a shed roof in the backyard, but. We're, we're seeing quite a bit of it. Ah, so it is coming. Yeah. It's a big problem. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I don't know if it's a problem. My my personal architectural taste, I, I live in a mid-century modern would be a charitable way to describe <laughs> the stick-built houses in my neighborhood. But some of the new, um, the new sheds that people are building that aren't ADUs and don't have to go through the, um, this design exercise um, are, you know, stucco they're you know slabby shed roofed um, really interestingly fenestrated structures that look awesome and um, and add to the elan of a neighborhood that severely lacks elan um, so you know I, I the way i see it you know what we're looking at here are two really good cleanups one that says you know we don't we don't want to make this height requirement apply in all cases because we see the value in pitched roofs. And the other that says we don't want the architectural design standards to apply in all cases to the extent that we don't want to force somebody to change the look of an existing shed that they want to 
turn into an ADU by adding a kitchen and a bathroom to it. And I think that just for the second one, um, you know, my preference would be to just say that um, that that dispensation that's being proposed here can go a step further, which is just don't require any of the ADUs to meet an architectural uniformity standard with the main dwelling. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. I'd like to hear from staff uh, why you felt the assigning the DADU architectural design standards uh, was a valuable um, tool in your toolbox. It's an existing, you know, uh, current regulation. I think we were taking the more incremental approach to changes. I think a larger change to this section we were envisioned as more of a broader policy discussion with a more in-depth um, project in the coming year. So I think we were to take an incremental approach to kind of tweak the rules to help uh, make the process easier for some of the cases and applicants, pre-applicants we've seen coming in. Okay, I appreciate that. And I would just say from my perspective, I'm pretty comfortable with incremental, and if it's going to be a longer discussion about perhaps eliminating this completely in the future, then we would come back to that as a separate conversation. David? Um, did, do, can you remind us, did you uh, tell us before when the DADU standards were originally put in place? It was quite a while ago, decades? I don't know the exact year, but I was I was looking back at the ordinance and it has, it has years underneath each section. I, I see 1994, okay. so I'm guessing that's when it went into it. Quite a while ago, yeah. So I think, you know, I think the, the question, I mean, it sounds to me like at least we support one and two. I, I haven't heard any dissension on that. And then we just have to ask ourselves whether we would want to try to venture into the territory of expanding the scope of this ordinance or just uh, call it out as something to look at for the future? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna say almost exactly the same thing, just in the spirit of trying to move us along too. So I appreciate everybody's thoughts on that. And just, uh, I think we didn't hear people say that they weren't comfortable with one and two code changes here. Um, am I putting words in everybody's mouth? Are we okay? No, I'm okay. Okay. Um, but there is, I'd say, some up percentage of interest in like addressing the DDA, DADU artificial design standards. So we can maybe talk about that at motion time or later. Or another suggestion might be if we want to take a straw poll on this before moving on to the next slide, mm -hmm. um, and that might help the motion maker decide whether they want to propose more or less. It's up to you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, the the uh, the way I would approach this is that. Um, <laughs> I am. Uh, I would actually just suggest that we either. Um, I guess if there's if there's broad support, I would um, in, as a part of this ordinance change be comfortable suggesting because it's a recommendation to city council. We're not making a final decision anywhere here um, to go ahead and omit the DADU architectural design standards from the code or potentially modernize them to reflect current ideas around architectural compatibility as opposed to something that's like sort of not true and um, outdated. Um, but I would also want to have a conversation around how to parse that and what, you know, where people land. So Sarah? I'm probably the only one who's going to say I, I'm, I find that just a little problematic because I don't feel I have enough information to, to um, Fair. Add, add anything. And I'd love to learn more and have this be part of a longer conversation um, uh, and I might end up saying yeah I totally agree but I feel like that's not what the information is that we've gotten and so I'm operating with inadequate knowledge yeah I, and I respect what you, both you and David have said about like sort of this is a little bit outside of the guardrails of the, what staff has raised to us right now so I guess I'm gonna suggest that at the end of this after we've completed this I'm gonna make a motion to recommend to City Council that they either do away with the ADU or they uh, modernize it Right, something to that effect, and hopefully, be a little more, a little bit more eloquent than that. Um, Peter, do you want to? I was going to ask when, when it is that we would have another chance to talk about this, because I don't want to lose an opportunity to um, beautify Boulder, or at least to keep Boulder from matching ugliness to the odd, <laughs> odd infinitum. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let's ask staff that process question then. So, if we were to recommend to City Council that they either, you know, modernize. Um, the DADU architectural design standards or um, get rid of them completely, could you guys prepare enough for them to be able to act on that when they see this, either as a part of this item or as a part of a different update? 
I mean, if we're talking about modernizing topic number two, I, I kind of like what one of you said regarding being a little bit more specific about what we're actually looking at in terms of architecture and how it matches the building. Um, so I think that's something that we could prepare for council. I was looking at materiality, color, form, fenestration. You know, we could add a sentence that relates to those, but again, we'd we'd have to get clarification about whether that would apply to existing buildings or new construction. And yeah, I think, I mean, the way I would s couch this, I see it, Lupita, I'll get you a sec, um, is that um, Landmarks Board and Landmark staff already use the Secretary of, Secretary of the Interior standards for this stuff. And it's super clear in how you don't mimic something that was built in the past. And it's, it is completely archaic to suggest that it, you would do that. And this is the only place in our code where we do that. We don't do it with historic structures. We don't do it next to historic structures. We don't do it in historic neighborhoods. So why on earth would you say, you know, Harmon's 60s ranch has got to have a ADU behind it looks just like a littler 60s ranch. 50s, but 50s. Even sorry. worse. So I just think it's nonsense. Well, I, I think you're <laughs> exaggerating what DADU does. Do you know? I We heard that <laughs> staff has discretion to apply their judgment on what is appropriate, which to me means that there's a lot of room for them for variety. Well, and let me... Again, there's no objective yeah. criteria there. Well, ever. So, so, but just to, just to be super clear, I have actually designed ADUs in this town and been through this process as an applicant, and I can tell you for a fact, having spoken to these guys regularly about it over the years, that typically what it drives you towards is matching siding matching color, the same things that they just said in this presentation. So while they do have some latitude in, in making the determination, they're following a guideline that lends towards matching, not a guideline that lends towards compatibility. So it's a different philosophical regulation that they're trying to interpret. Lupita. Yeah, actually I was thinking about this in terms of, you know, if we look at different parameters, like they mentioned color in materials, in my mind I was thinking, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do trying to make things complement. So in my mind I was pitching, you know, maybe different architecture but similar color, or uh, different architecture but similar texture. There are different ways that you can make things beautiful that don't have to be a mini-me of what you already have, whether it's beautiful or not. So I think flexibility could be in the, in the sense of that allowing, um, you know, to have your parameters, I'm sorry, I'm talking, you know, like the different options, and then when they're looking at those things, that there is a minimum um, that can be unnecessarily required, but there's something that there is latitude so that people have some guidelines or, you know, some guidance, but not necessarily, you know, too restrictive. Um, I'm, I'm all for flexibility, but it's also, I, I do believe that there's a balance that we can strike where we give people some choices where they can bring more beauty, mm -hmm. but not necessarily mm -hmm. in a very reproducible way. Thank you. Yeah. Carmen, and then we should see if we can like yeah. get off this one. Yeah. So, so I think you know, just to kind of make things clear, um, it's not like there, there, you know, there's some kind of huge battery of standards for design of ADUs. The, um, you know, it's not like there's a, you know, piece about materiality and there's a piece about fenestration. You know, all there is, is there's the height piece, and there's the architectural design piece. Two things, in the entire code. And what it used to say, or what it says now, sorry, is architectural design shall be consistent with the existing residents on the site or the adjacent buildings along the side yards of the lot. What's proposed is to add the words of new cons newly constructed accessory structures. So that's it. So if we wanted to take away the discretionary uh, design review authority of staff so that people could submit designs for ADUs without uh, the requirement that they be consistent with the existing resident, you just strike 963C3. That's all, that's it. it's just that's those all you do. Sentences. You just take yeah. that sentence one out, sentence. it's one yeah. sentence. Well, that was easy. So, you know, we're not talking about, you know, getting rid of some well thought out set of architectural <laughs> review no. standards, we're talking about getting rid of one sentence. Uh, alternatively, and I really am inspired by Lupita here, um, when we look at how does staff react when you know they have a discretionary decision to make 
Well, they should go back to the code and see what kind of guidance the code gives them. And what the code says is the design shall be consistent with the existing residence. And so what Brian is saying is that Compatible. since consistent is so, you know, such a clear word, then you just, well, if it's lap siding, you gotta do lap siding. If it's pitch roof, you gotta do pitch roof because that's all you got, the word consistent. What Lupita said was complement, okay? So if you change the words, shall be consistent with, to shall complement the existing residence. Now, staff's got flexibility to say, does this design complement? Mm. And if you're comfortable with staff having that type of discretion, I'd rather have staff exercising discretion over complementary design than consistent design. You know, if you want to give them discretion, give them some discretion. And if you don't want staff to have to deal with this discretionary piece, just lose paragraph C. That's, that's the way I'd put it. Can I just ask Sarah, a Sarah, then John. I just want to ask, a, I think it's an interesting approach. Thank you for grounding us in reality. And, but I'd like to ask staff who has to deal with um, applicants who are coming in um, asking for ADU, um, uh, to build ADUs, what would it mean from a staff's perspective to have the term complementary rather than consistent? What, how would that change what our planning staff does with clients? <coughs> I'll speak for myself. I'm a little concerned that using the term complementary might add more ambiguity than yeah. consistent, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, and I'll speak for Carl and myself and Andrew and Gabby. I think that will probably introduce a lot more ambiguity than we're used to dealing with now. So, but that, so I think, I think your idea is interesting and the challenge of ambiguity is important to, co to include in this conversation. And I'll come back to what I said before. I, I appreciate the conversation about maybe we should just get rid of two or, but I think it's, an, it's a step we can take that then, and then we can open it up for a longer conversation where we can take into account what, what might be an alternative standard, set of standards that could apply that would eliminate ambiguity but also allow for flexibility but I don't think we're gonna to get to that this evening. Wh when would we? I'm still, I'm still <laughs> confused about when we would do that. Yeah. Well, it's actually part of our, it's under, I mean, uh, ADUs is actually part of the 2020 midterm update of the Boulder Valley Comp Plan, so maybe we'd come back to it. Let's just check with Charles on that. Well, yeah, and it, it would be have to be something that council would prioritize in their work program for us to study. And I can't remember what commitments were made when we did the last round of updates, but I do seem to remember that we were gonna go back and evaluate how things were working and report back. Yeah, there was an, a phase two anticipated, right. but I think a lot of the things that were supposed to be addressed in phase two were then rolled into phase one. Right. Yeah, I'd rather not kick the can down the road. Yeah. I'd rather do our duty now. Mm -hmm. and I mean, I'm gonna say right now, my, my perspective is that the, the um, sheds in my neighborhood are basically the best buildings in my neighborhood. <laughs> and they're not, they're not subject to this conformity standard. So I think you remove paragraph C and just do it now. You know, we're, we're, we're here, we're the planning board, we're making a recommendation to council. It's, uh, yeah. you know, if, you, if you're in favor of an incremental approach, you know, we'll wait until it comes back. I'm personally not, that's where I'm gonna vote. Okay, David? Um, I wanna make sure that we don't torpedo what is really good here, which is that we're removing DADU from, new, uh, from uh, existing. Uh, existing. Uh, so um, I'm wondering if we could um, do it as, a, um, if planning board feels that way, as, as, as making sure that we say that we support the proposed code change and would uh, recommend going one step further and. Correct. So that, may, that way it's clear to city council that we do support this and that we, but that we, because I do, now that you, I, I thought maybe there was more to it because it wasn't in our packet really telling us exactly what went into the DADU, but if it's really just those couple of sentences, I would, or one sentence even, I would feel quite comfortable um, making that recommendation because uh, um, I don't think that there, I, I think that my concern about harm is pretty much uh, gone away. Cool. Let me see if we can just um, move ahead to the next piece of this. Um, I think what we should do is talk about this as people have a chance to think about it as we go through the process when we have a motion on the table. Um, we can figure out which, why in the road we wanna take. Um, 
So can we get the next uh, round to item two and three, three of our 17 hour planning board meeting? <laughs> um, only seven points. Yep, item three is the ADU <laughs> and co-op change uh, that would prohibit it express expressly from being on the same property. Peter, no. Yeah. What uh, Harmon? Who, who wants to speak? Yeah, I sorry, I'm just, there's like oh. lots of hands going up, so I'm like, okay, Harmon, David, I'm okay. like whacking them Say all. Say yes or no, and then I'll okay. on you. So, you know, I, I wanted to um, give a shout out to Claudia, who spoke earlier um, about uh, sort of what, what we could do to, um, to clarify, um, well, if we felt like not creating this limit of uh, co-ops and ADUs on the same lot, what we could do to, quali to, to clarify that uh, there's, an, there's a, a way to uh, limit the impacts um, or, or make sure that it's understood that these apply to the whole lot and not just the dwelling. And, and so I, I think that, and, and an elegant solution, if you agree, would be um, in 985D, where it says all such dwelling units shall be limited to no fewer than four occupants with a maximum number of occupants without regard to whether the occupants are related or not as follows, and then gives all the limitations, 12 in the low density districts, 15 in the higher density zoning districts. If you just added the, the six simple words, all such dwelling units and their accessory dwelling units, comma, if any. Then you would just make sure that all of the occupancy and intensity standards that you expect for uh, the individual and, and collective zoning districts would apply on a per lot basis. And, and if you say it applies to a per lot basis, I tried that out, it actually gets sticky and, and it's, it's really hard to, to apply things that, that have to do with bedroom size and stuff to lots. So I think just by adding that simple clause and their accessory dwelling units, if any, um, accomplishes all the goals that I heard from the members of the community in terms of that limitation. And you know, just remembering that that, that does nothing to change the requirement for a trash management plan, nothing to change the requirement for a parking management plan, nothing to change the maximum of three on-street parking spaces, um, you know, nothing to change all the licensure requirements. Um, so I, I, that's my solution. My reason is that I like the idea of creating um, the potential of different kinds of housing units uh, for different types of people and living situations, and I'm convinced by that argument. Well, thanks, Harmon. I think that's a really good su suggestion. Yeah, and uh, um, I don't know if there are any other places where a clarification might um, be needed, but yeah, I would go with uh, not just uh, you know uh, prohibiting the ADUs, but find out well if, it, like like Harmon said, he uh, he identified exactly the kind of thing that we we need to do. Uh, if there are other, I, I just am not convinced by the unintended consequences because I haven't really heard any that I uh, that I think. Our problem, so uh, yeah, I would I would definitely not su support uh, uh, the, the the code change on the table, but would would want to investigate if, if anybody knows any other like details that would need to be loopholes that need to be closed or anything. That's fine, right, Sarah? Uh, so since we're speculating, why don't you all tell us what are some of the unintended consequences that have come across the transom that led you to recognize that this was a a void in the law? I don't know that we that came to a conclusion that there was going to be significant impact by allowing both an ADU and a co-op on the same property. I think when I had worked on a pre-app uh, on this topic, I think we felt that this was something that was not considered right. in either the ADU regs or the co-op regs and should be addressed somehow. Um, so that's why we were suggesting that uh, it not be permitted. Um, I don't know that the parking plan was thought out, you know, with a co-op and an ADU. Um, and I think our conclusion or our interpretation of, of the occupancy regs related to co-ops is the same as what we've been talking about tonight, that it would still be subject to that maximum 12 in um, for a co-op. Um, but that's not 100% clear in the code. So I think what, what Harmon had recommended as a change to that section is what we would recommend if, if the policy decision was to allow an ADU 
and a co-op on the same property. And would um, the economics of a, a of a co-op? Um, it who who owns a co-op? Because the owner of the co-op is the person who would have to build the ADU. There's different types of co-ops. There's actually like three definitions right. in um, Title X, uh, and some have an ownership structure and some are just rental. Right. So if there were to be a circumstance with an ADU and a co-op, it would have to be one of those that have an ownership structure and there would have to be at least 50% ownership on the property because the ADU regs require the owner to be on the property, live on the property and that they're... Um, right, so it sounds like there's a minimal number of potential uh, co-ops where this would even apply. I mean, there's, there's eight co-ops now, and I think what I heard from David was that it's been a challenge to um, uh, find the new co-op. A lot of new co-ops have not um, entered into the system, um, and so this solves a problem that may not yet exist, but it also further uh, limits where this could happen. So that I help appreciate that. Let me just clarify. So, if a, let's say you found there was a, someone who had the fifty percent or more ownership, and they want and they wanted to turn their home into a co-op, and they wanted to build an ADU, would the ADU rules apply, or do the co-op rules apply? Like, what they applies? Both apply. They both. So they have to. They would have to build the ADU under the constrictions of both of these. Right. Sets of regs. Yeah, we'd have to get information about the co-op and its ownership structure to come to the conclusion that the owner is on the site and living yeah. on the site. I think as far as unintended consequences, again, we didn't see any significant consequences, but we could see where the current occupancy standards, because they're not 100% clear, could lead to some interpretations that the ADU and co-op provisions apply, making the occupancy greater, and that was not something that was anticipated. So Harmon's solution help addresses that. Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, Claudia's solution. <laughs> Lupita, you had your hand up a minute ago. Uh, I think that, that kind of clarified the question that I had. Okay. Thank okay. you. Cool. Peter? Sorry. I was doing that before you gasped in. <laughs> gasped in. <laughs> I, I, I agree with theatrics over there. Uh, <laughs> Exactly. It, nothing. The the parking. It's 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 a nothing. It, it's a chance for us to add this language, which we don't. We shouldn't even need to, but we will because it'll make people feel better. So I agree with the way that Harvin put it when I jumped out saying no. Yes, I was joking coming off your 17-hour planning board joke. <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, let's layer that on and be clear. Cool. Can I gasp yep. in now? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so if uh, if the co-op, let's say it's an equity co-op, um, if the if the, um, the LLC or whoever you know is the owner of the co-op um, is the technical occupant of the co-op, then can the entity build an ADU? under the ADU's owner occupancy requirement? Or do we, because if not, you know, if, if we need to have, you know, if there are 12 people or 10 people living in the co-op and we need whatever, you know, somebody to be f worth five people to be an owner, which is impossible. Um, and what Sarah is saying comes to pass that you end up just limiting the number of people, the number of co-ops that can even get an ADU then maybe my six word solution needs to be augmented with a line that specifically authorizes co-ops to apply for and receive ADU permits. Yeah, to take them out of that ownership requirement, that owner occupancy requirement. If yes. we can't define what an owner is. The ADU regulations require a fee simple ownership and that that person live on the property. Okay, so is, but is that gonna 50%. be enough um, that the, the ownership of the co-op and the owner occupant, uh, or the, the co-op having an owner occupant, is that going to be enough? When, when Carl mentioned the 50% piece, it, it, it gives me pause and I wanna understand how staff would interpret that requirement and whether, um, 
I think our interpretation in reading the definition of a private equity cooperative is that that, that would fulfill that requirement. The owner requirement. It says you have to have at least two thirds of adult non-dependent residents own an interest in the property. Um, at least two thirds of the in individual who own an interest in the property and reside on the property. Okay, so as long as the, the ownership entity that holds the fee simple title to, to that co-op property is the applicant and the, the constructor of the ADU, that's gonna be allowed under the, the current ADU code. And that's for an equity co-op, primarily, right? <clears throat> Harmon, are you worried that the ADU rules are gonna now be a limiting factor on co-ops because you have to live on site? Yes. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah it's a 50% ownership question. Yeah, but yep. then we're now, but now I think we're getting into co-op regulation versus the specific, I mean, we, which may be something we wanna open up again at some point, but that's not. Yeah, I think what Harmon's trying to do is a, is a good way of kind of keeping us out of doing that. Um, Cause I don't think we wanna, I mean, we're not trying to open up a whole new topic for this evening. I think what we're trying to do is say like, if you do want to have um, a co-op like the ones that exist now that um, have a diversity of, so I'll go ahead and call it myself cause this is my opinion on this stuff. <laughs> I'm super ultra passionately opposed to this. I think it's totally the wrong thing to do to say that since we haven't talked about it, the answer should be no. Like just in terms of like, like the philosophy of creating rules in our world, like, uh, we haven't talked about that. Let's make a law against it. Like, I don't want to live in that kind of town. Um, if we've thought about it thoroughly and we want to make a law against it, cool. Or if we have an actual problem that's come up and we may need to make a law to protect people, cool. I, I think I have a problem with the basis of this thing. But then to talk about the actual deal here, um, you know, if we do have, we do have co-ops in town that have um, a diversity of housing types within them, right? So inside the co-op, community, you're able to live in a single bedroom or share a bedroom with somebody else, or if you have the ability to go to the apartment that's part of it and have your own kitchen, that opens it up to some people who maybe just need a little, like, another layer of privacy. Or if somebody has a baby and they want to live in there and they move in with their husband or um, spouse or partner or whatever, pet, um, they get to have their own space. And I think there's nothing uh, wrong with that because the thing that caps the occupancy of the project is still the same. And that's what went through the process. That occupancy limit cap for co-ops is what got flogged through the giant long process. And I'm not suggesting that we open that up. I'm just saying we follow it and let that be the guiding principle. And I think Harmon's suggestions about how to deal with this in terms of language are spot on. John. Well, I, I, I get your point, but I think that ownership was a, a major part of that process also. Of the ADU process. process. I was talking ADU about process some of the co-op process. Uh, Pardon. I was talking about the co-op <coughs> process. Well, which is both the ADU one. process and we spent a lot of time in the co-op process mm -hmm. worrying about rental versus equity versus, I can't even remember all the different categories. And I think that that needs to be clarified before we move ahead and explicitly encourage all different kinds of co-ops to build ADUs. Yeah. So I don't oppose ADUs with co-ops, but I think that the, the current lack of clarity regarding ownership is important because it played such a big role in the ADU process. And so I am I am reluctant to move ahead with what you're mm -hmm. proposing until we get that clarified. Yeah, I think we can talk about that tonight. So I think, you know, during the ADU process, there was never a conversation around co-ops having an ADU. So that's ne that actually is never seen the light of day until this process. So now we're talking about it. Um, ADUs, the desire to have people uh, living on site meant that people felt more comfortable with the idea that things would be t well taken care of and it'd be a compatible use with the rest of the neighborhood. So the ADU piece of it, I wouldn't try to peel that back at all. I, I don't think we should try to question. I think that's, that is, I think, really well tested in the political sphere of our town right now. So we don't wanna try to undo that. But I would say that the, um, we hadn't talked about having an ADU with a co-op, so that hasn't mm -hmm. been discussed. So, Can, can I ask a Carmen. question of Hella, please? Hella, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, you're probably looking at this, but um, maybe the code already provides for this, because if you look at um, in 963 in the specific use standards for the detached accessory dwelling units, 
it says an owner or the owners of a lot or a parcel with an existing single family dwelling unit may establish and maintain a detached accessory dwelling unit. So if the limiting factor is just that an owner, so if, Four owners. if yeah. one of the nine people at the co-op is an owner occupant, that person would be charged with establishing the new detached ADU, and maybe we don't have a problem. What were you looking at? So if, if you go to detached accessory dwelling units in 963, yeah. the second sentence, an owner or the owners of a lot, And, and what problem did you think that was going to resolve? Sorry, I didn't follow. Well, I guess the, the, the reason why we're having this discussion is just to make sure that um, there isn't a scenario where um, some notion of collective ownership defeats the notion of owner occupancy. That if owner occupancy is kind of narrowly defined as, you know, this single family homeowner can build an ADU. And now you have this co-op with an ownership structure that's more distributed. Um, would that stand in the way of a co-op being able to apply for and receive a permit to construct an ADU? So I'm asking if this second sentence after detached accessory dwelling units, which just says an owner, which would mean any one owner, gets mm -hmm. us out of that conundrum and says, yes, the co-ops could, in fact, with one owner occupant, apply for and receive a permit to get an ADU. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that. That's what I wanted to know. And it, it comes down to the definition of owner occupied. Mm -hmm. And it states that at least one owner of record of the lot or parcel upon which the dwelling unit or accessory unit is located who possesses at least an estate for life or a 50% fee simple ownership interest or is a trustor of a revocable trust has to have his principal residence there. So you can set up a co-op and an ADU provided that an owner who owns, for example, at least a 50% fee ownership interest in the pro property, and that's the deed showing the fee simple ownership interest in that person, not an LLC, for example, mm -hmm. um, also has the principal residence on the property. So that doesn't allow all possible co-op mm -hmm. structures. Okay. So but that really is set up designed that way. for, you know, married couple, you know, one or, you know, more of the, the couple can go apply for an ADU because the 50% minimum ownership mm -hmm. interest. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the intentions behind the, <laughs> the owner occupancy and that it's true owner occupancy is to make sure that the owner lives there and makes sure that the property is being properly maintained and the character of the neighborhood remains single family dwelling and so forth. So would the spirit of the of that rule be withheld if you wanted an owner to live on it, but now not only do you have an owner, you have six owners living there. So you actually, if the spirit was to make sure that there's someone who cares someone who has held accountable for the actions, now you know only you have more than one person in a co-op situation, you have all of them. So mm -hmm. it's actually com it, compatible yeah. with the spirit of the rule. The rule would not allow it right now, although you could still set it up that way if one ownership and that person would live there had Person with the big bedroom and who got their dinner first. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I guess, you know, I'm... Could I ask you a question? Lupita's yeah. training. I've had my... So, oh, really, you've had your hand up so. a while, too. I don't know. So I'd like to move just a little bit different direction because I'm thinking about this creative way of living and who does it attract. I'd like to know if there's any statistics about who chooses to live this way <laughs> and whether that attracts just one kind of people or are we really adding to the diversity that we, that we claim you want to provide. So are this sort of, I mean, we've gone through a long length of how we're gonna make this accessible to people, and I said, who, who lives this way? And is this gonna add to the diversity of our city, or it's not? And so if there's any data out there to give me a sense that this is really gonna help 
diverse people, and I diverse I don't mean somebody who's 25 years old but still white and male, or a high school student that just decided not to go to see you or went to see you and came out, but still the same demographics. I like to see, if, are we really gonna be providing legitimate resources and, and, and space to make this community diverse as we claim you want to? That's kind of like what I'm sitting and because I know we, we're trying very hard to do the right thing here and I, I appreciate it so deeply, but is this gonna help us? Thank you. I think we, it would be great to uh, call uh, Elena up here just to give a quick answer to that because we have sort of firsthand experience in the room. Um, so keep yeah. your comments as short as you can to talk about. I would say that goals. my experience is anecdotal and I think Lincoln may have statistics that are more quantitative. Um, I currently live with housemates who are immigrants from Eritrea, Iran, and Switzerland. Um, who have French citizenship, and in the past I've lived with several Mexican-Americans, with folks who are either directly from or first-generation, or I guess technically second-generation parents from Ghana, Mexico, the Philippines, um, at least five African-Americans off the top of my head. There is incredible like racial, ethnic, national origin diversity within the co-ops, um, in addition to sort of socioeconomic and income diversity. So I would say that that they are certainly like anchors and islands of rich diversity in a community that isn't always that way. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you the, so much. The only people that who don't really want to live helps. there are the venture capitalists, basically. Can I, um, I've, I've been yeah. waiting for a while. Um, I, <laughs> I really want to ask this Sorry. question. Um, what what we've we I think there's been a lot of um, opposition to the proposed code change expressed, which would leave us in a, in the state that we're in right now unless we consider one of these potential thing, alternatives, which would be to in fact make it more accessible to the idea of a, a to use of you know, for co-ops, uh, which we can do. But um, I, I'm just curious, um, do we have? Do we know if there are any co-ops that would pass this owner-occupied standard? Because it, sound, it looks to me like uh, that would shut out most of them because, uh, right, right, because of the way that owner-occupied is, is defined. So, so it, it seems to me that that just kind of already puts a barrier. So we'd be looking at trying to fix that, right? Or am I mistaken? Are there a lot of uh, ones that you could say would fit that? Yeah, I, I think it's... It's two complex sets of regulations mm. that both have to be met. Um, so, uh, I, but I, I don't process the applications. I don't know if we have anybody here who's processed them or if we know the answer to that. Gabby would have known, but she just left the building. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know what type of ownership yeah. co-ops we have actually approved. Okay. There's two. Maybe should we should ask Lincoln to come up and just do a quick answer to that question if you guys want to know the answer. Sure. So yeah, I, I'd really like to know because I think that so you have um, experts in the room. We usually don't. I think call there's a lot of interest in seeing if we can get it get to this. Yeah. But it's, so you know. Again, a quick answer. Thanks. Quick answer. Out of the ones that are approved, two would satisfy the requirement because the owner lives in the building. So that's 20 percent, approximately 20 percent. And when you say the owner, Lincoln, you mean the person who owns at least 50% of the title to that building? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they, they own 100% in both cases. Okay. Um, the other case that's interesting is the nonprofit ownership case. But I don't think that works. I think Hella just explained that mm -hmm. it's got to be a natural person with 50% of the equity in the title to that. Yeah, right. and, and do we need to prohibit? But I thought a corporation is a citizen in this country of ours. <laughs> Holder is in a bubble that's not part of this country. Yeah, and nonprofits are less than citizens, I guess. So I'm just like, so I know, I'm just trying to like see if I can keep it together here. Um, so we have, uh, I guess the question that you asked was um, how many we would have, or how many we do have, there's two out of the eight that exist. Um, that could have an ADU based on this. And then the other thing that Lincoln just brought up was, uh, is there a need to prohibit a nonprofit that owns a co-op from having an ADU? Is that a thing that we need to have a rule against as well? So 
Uh, Sarah had her hand up, and then David. No, no, you keep going. Do you want me to get, well, I, <laughs> I, I mean, my, my uh, preference would be uh, to open up uh, the ability for ADUs to be placed in co-op situations for all ownership structures. I would like to look at that as a baseline because I just think that it's so arbitrary to have the uh, uh, owner-occupied rule apply to co-ops. So that's what, where I would start. Cool. Let me just pin you there for a second, Sarah. Um, who else agrees with David? I certainly do. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Do residents of the ADU, are they required to be in the co-op? It's not explicitly required in the code. Yeah, it's not addressed. But typically they would be. I mean, if you're... Well, I, I can um, imagine, but I can also imagine a situation in which it doesn't take place. And I think that's one, one of those... They are. One of the things that staff would like clarified in, in I mean, standards. I, I, I can just say that I would be much more favorably inclined to this if there's a condition saying that the residents of the ADU are members of the co-op. I think that's a fine thing yeah, to, to ask for. Yeah, that fits with everything we've said tonight. Yeah. So let's. So I agree with that. Let's tie those two things together. How, how many people are comfortable with that? Sort of as something that Hella can work on in the background while we're moving ahead. With jo with John's addendum. <laughs> with John's addendum, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't think for John, John you got to vote for it. But you guys are not putting your hands up, so you aren't going to answer. <laughs> it. Can, I, can I just confirm? I think I'm in favor of this, okay. but I, I've lost track of our. Some of our David to re-express his Are we still quickly. talking about the situation which Harmon described in which the total number of folks living on the lot and the total parking uh, requirements mm -hmm. and other aspects remain in place? Yes, they still yes. have to meet the co-op rules and occupancy limits. Yeah. Can I just Super clarify brief? what okay. I just what I think what, what I would be proposing would be to add the six words that I proposed to, to make it clear that the occupancy requirements apply to the ADU and the, the co-op um, to, uh, to make it explicit that co-ops can have ADUs so as to clarify this issue that about owner occupancy that's turning everybody's heads and knots. Just one line that says co-ops can have ADUs and then one more line that says um, co-ops that have ADUs have to have all of their occupants be part of the co-op. It's just a three-piece. Cool. So, Strapple, on that, before there's any questions, can you express an opinion? Just so we can, I'm trying to well, hear from everybody here, and we're getting some people who are not being so, heard at all. So, I, oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm trying to think that just the default is the maximum number of people is whatever the co op maximum is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still I'll governed by the same rule. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of clarified for me. Okay. So, what, I, anything. what I'm struggling so. with. Um, is the idea, it, it's, it's the intersection of ownership and um, the allowance for co-ops to have ADUs. I, I feel like that is a regulatory tangle that uh, David's suggestion um, doesn't, it, it, it actually create, I don't think it doesn't create a tangle. It, uh, reveals a tangle that we don't have a solution to. And I don't think it makes sense to propose something that uh, then that then requires a huge amount of legal um, unpacking. So just, I think, um, maybe Harmon, would you say your things again? Because I think actually it just, it nails that down and doesn't leave any tangle. Okay, so. I think it incorporates what David had to say. But tell me if it's wrong. Well, David, I'll, I'll comment after Harmon reads. Okay. So, okay. so first, um, in 985D, you would say that all of these dwelling units licenses, all the cooperatives and their accessory dwelling units, if any, shall be limited to, so it just to. applies to the whole set of 12 in the residential districts that are low density and 15 in the higher. So it, it just makes it clear okay. that an ADU and a co-op are still limited to the same dwelling unit um, limits, uh, the same number, number of occupants oh, yeah. okay. limits that would be uh, limited to a dwelling unit, a, a cooperative dwelling unit. Okay, so that's part one. Part two is right now we have this this problem with really a more of a legislative tangle here, which is that we have this definition of owner occupancy that you have to refer back to 
to see if you're allowed to have an ADU. And because that definition would preclude ADUs that have distributed ownership, you can untangle that by just overriding it. You can say notwithstanding owner occupancy requirements elsewhere in this code, a cooperative can have an ADU. Yep. So that just, you know, the notwithstanding yeah, that's what I want to override to. says nobody has to think twice about this. Nobody has to consult another section of the code. It's just here. ADUs are allowed with co-ops. It's positive. And then the third piece would be that all residents of the co-op and the ADU on the, you know, that's associated with the co-op have to be members of the co-op. So I think everybody understands that reiteration of that. Hopefully, can we get a straw poll on support? Does that make sense? That? It makes sense, but I, I don't think it solves the problem. I think the, the first problem? half solves the problem. I think the second half, uh, it's I'm having a hard time understanding uh, how a uh, co-op uh, that is um, made up of individuals who are members, but they're not permanent members, they're members, and there's going to be some some ownership by these members of a new building that's by definition going to cost three hundred or four hundred thousand dollars to build. I, I see that as being a potential. I get the I get the goal, but I see that as being the kind of ticking time bomb that would blow a co-op into smithereens when there starts to be discussions over who owns what. And I'm just concerned, I'm kind of concerned about that. Um, and I am I feel like, uh, I mean, I don't want to stand in the way of progress, but it just seems like sticking with the ownership requirements for, I guess, what we're calling the equity, um, the pers the private equity or uh, so there's there's nothing in the current requirements that would allow a co-op to own an ADU at all. No, no, I'm saying, the, no, but totally what, doesn't what, work. But no, but what we've talked about is if you are uh, you own you actually own the building that is the co-op, and uh, that would allow that co-op to then build an ADU because there is an owner of the parcel that has built the initial building and or owns the initial building. I'm just concerned about. Um, uh, Maybe I can answer your okay. question because yeah. I'm very familiar with how co-ops yeah. work and the ownership, the shared owning of things is really at the heart of how co-ops organize themselves. That's that's how they function is the the elegant management of shared spaces and shared ownership. So there's a few different ownership options. One is really equity co-op, and that's when someone in the building or some group of people, most commonly a group of people, own it. So let's say like three people have just put their money in together and they're going to buy a house and they're going to turn into a co-op that has nine people in it and they want to build an ADU to fit um, somebody who otherwise wouldn't be able to stay there. So that wouldn't be allowed in this code even though they're people who live on the site because no individual owns more than 50%. They own it three ways. So there's no reason to stop them from doing it. It doesn't have the problem that you're thinking of. And then institutional or nonprofit co-ops um, have an on-site, off-site ownership. Um, like Boulder Housing Coalition um, or potentially Goose Creek. And so they're able to, like they own the building. And so there's not a squabble amongst the owners about who owns it. Um, the nonprofit owns it. So it's, I think um, probably what's leading to the ambiguity you're feeling is like just like uh, not knowing about how co-ops work internally. But I, I think I can explain that well enough. Or I hope I have. What's the third? If I haven't, then maybe Lincoln could do it because I still the, don't right, always. the third way? Right. It was three ways, right? Well, I just was sticking to the two. Yeah, I, I just wanted, can I make my point that I wanted to make? Uh, so um, there, there was a lot of thought put in to the co-op ordinance with regard to co-op ownership. Uh, that was all very well defined and, uh, and it really overrides the, uh, the owner-occupied portion of ADU because it's all there. And, I th and th that's what you were saying. Yeah, it's right. I just wanted to say it that way because yeah. to me that this is a simple way of looking at it. All of the ownership uh, concerns around co-ops have already been uh, taken care of. So what we're asking for is to then separate that from uh, specific owner-occupied uh, things that apply to private homes that are being used for ADUs. The co-op situation is very clear, and uh, it already includes a building with all the yard and all the things that go with it. So uh, there's not going to be um, that I can see unless somebody can point out something else, any, any additional complexity with uh, whether it's a single building or a single building with an ADU or whatever. It's all pretty much the, 
falls within the umbrella of the co-op. So, uh, so that's how I'm looking at it. I, and I wanted to just get that out there because, because I do think a lot of thought went into the ownership of co-ops. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, David. Lupita, and then I think Peter, you were waving too. I think I think that really clears up for me because that was my concern. It seems to me that that nuance part is already taken care of by the co-ops themselves, and and I've thought of that. But uh, I really like the idea of adding flexibility. As long as we have kind of like the same limits, now we're just giving more flexibility, potentially more choices in terms of the kind of people that can come in that are willing to live in that space, especially now they have more private spaces for families. Um, so I'm feeling better and better. I appreciate that everybody's willing to unpack it more. So I'm, thank you. Yeah, cool. In including the public, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Does Peter have anything? No, just that I like that we're creating a more equitable environment for people to have a diverse housing situation. I was really um, moved by the idea that not everybody wants to live in uh, the same house and families. Um, yeah, I just love what we're getting at here. And so I think it really gets to it and it solves the, the issues. And I like that Sarah brought up the real world scenario of, of ownership. And I like that you came back with, well, that's how it's, that's at the heart of it, the structures. So, um, someone's gonna have the house itself they're gonna deal with and the APU <coughs> is gonna follow the same pathway. So it's not adding another thing they're gonna squabble over because it's already resolved. Yeah. John? I, I think the motive here is good and I think the, the way in which we're approaching it is good. I think that I will be able to support it, but I would like with an additional uh, recommendation that I would like the board to see if they agree with one. And that pertains to this concern about potential HOAs and subdivision that we talked about previously. And, uh, and uh, I, I would just like the board, in connection with this, to recommend to city council that they review the potential for uh, this kind of uh, a, what I call abuse of the of the ADU process for for subdivision and ensure that that it that we have our regulations in place to make sure that it doesn't happen unless we want it to happen. Agreed. So that that would set my mind at ease in being able to join in this uh, with this recommendation. Cool. I, I fully support that myself. I would. Um, I think we should. And if it needs to be a part of this motion, that's fine with me, but I think it might hold more power as a separate motion after this thing. But I'd, I would support it either way. If okay, you feel like it's I'd gotta like be part of it. See if the rest of the Yeah, I, I agree with, okay. with, with you that it's an important thing. Uh -huh. um, and I'm not and I think that if it, and I agree with Brian that I, I think uh, as a separate recommendation, a standalone recommendation for okay. council. As long as we can get that message in there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. that. And if yeah, you want to draft it, well, with you. John, if you want to draft it, <laughs> I'm not as recommendation. coherent as you are. But uh, anyway, I'll you can take a tr crack at it. I'll take a crack. <laughs> okay. Or Hella could take a crack at it. All right. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'm going to see if we can move to the next one. If you guys are all cool with that, if we've exhausted ourselves on that one. The, the last one is the occupancy language uh, shifting the language consistent between persons and rumors across that yeah and go for it um so yeah i'm not going to say a word about this except that you know i appreciate the uh, clarification um that staff and hella put together for this you know everybody pretty cool with it cool i will note that the ibc does not have a definition for rumors that's why we need it's actually not in there <laughs> <laughs> just fyi they didn't it may use we were the saying word. rooming unit. Oh, uh, rooming unit. Okay, cool. I didn't see that in there either. Well, it's actually in Title 10 of the Boulder Revised Code. Right. And it's maybe, not in the IBC. Maybe in Title 1 as well. Yeah, <laughs> cool. But definitely not in the IBC. <laughs> okay. Um, I think no one seems to have a problem with that other than my, my little brief tirade earlier. <laughs> um. So do we need a 
So we're going to vote on this motion, and then we'll need a separate motion for bringing forward to City Council the material that Holly Rogan. Yeah, just the question about okay. uh, HOAs in the City of Boulder. Okay. I'll go and make a motion. Um, I'm going to mo move the Planning Board recommends the City Council approve the ordinances generally found. Attachment A to update the ADU standards, and I'm going to throw myself on Harmon's. Um, hopefully, that you've got some uh, conditions, okay. friendly conditions to offer on there. Does anyone want to second it? I'll second it. Okay. Can um, I make a friendly to my own? You second? can make a friendly <laughs> to your own second. Okay. So my, my friendly amendment would be um, to. Uh, and we can, can we go back to the slide for one and two? I think I can probably work it out. Um, Uh, so, uh, the planning board further recommends um, the following additional uh, changes, which would be uh, one, to remove the architectural design standard for detached uh, accessory dwelling units found in, I think it was, can we just get the paragraph? Um, it was 963. It's going to be. Sorry. It's hard to nail down all those headings. 963. Under detached, so it's going to be A3. Uh, A3. C. A three C. Uh, C. A three uh, triple I. A three little <laughs> little three C. Yeah, C little three C. Yeah. yeah. One of the things yeah. I love about the formatting in the land use code is that the so it's, margins it's change nine page to page. It's two. nine six three A little A three. Um, Big C. Big C, I, I, I. little Roman three, little I, 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 little C, little C. Little yeah, yeah, yeah. So we just, weird. We just want that one sentence removed. It's weird because that's my Netflix password too. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till the meeting's over so I can Netflix and chill on your account. <laughs> all right. Okay. Roof, so that's roof pitches all day long. That is the first change that we're recommending. The the <laughs> second two, item two. Well, it's not really going to be item two anywhere. Right. So we're just going to recommend that that's that's the only change. So that to to clarify for anybody who's wondering, that leaves this item one on the slide alone. So we're still recommending that yep. that change. Okay, can we get the next slide? And then for ADU, um, I sent Cindy the six additional words: the um, changing nine eight five D. Uh, to add and their accessory dwelling units, comma, if any, comma, after such dwelling units in the second sentence. Um, and in addition, uh, to um, add a, a provision that says, notwithstanding owner occupancy requirements elsewhere in the code, um, cooperative housing units may, um, may have ADUs. Uh, and then finally, uh, ADUs uh, that are part of cooperative, that are associated with cooperative housing units, uh, all the, the um, limitations. No, that, that one's taken care of already. Okay. All of the residents of a cooperative housing unit with an ADU in both uh, the cooperative housing unit and the accessory dwelling unit have to be members of that cooperative. I accept your friendly amendment, and I am so appreciative of you being able to put it together. Is is, the, is it clear then that because um, we did say in the amend in the uh, motion that we support this, is it clear that we're actually kind of rejecting all of three in and replacing it with what Harmon just said? Yeah. yeah. Is that clear? Okay. Is that clear. Cool. Yeah. As long as thank you. That's the case. Okay. Anyone want to speak to this, or can we call a vote? Just speak to it. I, I mean, I'm going to vote for it, but I am. Um, I, I'm still struggling with the uh, eliminating that one paragraph because I'm. Sh it. My sense is it leaves 
no guidance at all on design guidelines. And that I just want to put myself on the record as saying I'm a little concerned about the implications for staff um, in dealing with uh, that when um, proposals come in for ADUs. Well, it should I, be a lot quicker since they don't have to do it. Can I respond to that too? Yeah. And, and uh, you know, this is not meant to be a tit for tat, um, but I do want to put this out there. Uh, unlike Boulder County, which has site plan review, when you when you try to build a brand new house on an empty lot, you don't have the right to just go in and apply for a building permit. You have to go through a planning review to make sure that this new house, you know, is uh, meets the all the you know various, site various review criteria criteria, and you know that it. You know, it, it has to you know be compatible with the neighborhood, and it can't be in an animal migration corridor and all this stuff. People do have the right to submit a building permit by right in the city of Boulder, and there is no style review in the city of Boulder for the main house. So the thing that everybody sees when they walk down the street and drive down the street is in exactly the situation that we're trying to make available for ADUs too. People can build what they want. We already have that right for the 3,000 square foot behemoth in front. So why not have it for the 550 square foot, you know, shed in the back? Maybe we need to fix the behemoth problem. <laughs> John. Speaking as a uh, former member of the Boulder County Planning Commission, I, I think that the county uh, does it just right uh, in terms of its uh, process. But that's not for us to deal with here. But with respect to the design, uh, the change in approach to design, I certainly get your point and I'm, I'm, I'm supportive of it and that's why I'm supporting this. But I can say I thought that your first proposal to change uh, the, the wording from, uh, I forget what it was, from, from consistent to, consistent to, to com complementary, hmm? or complementary or complementary. Appeal to me much It did more. to me too. So I trust staff. I, I think they could have worked with that, but let's just anyway. see if we can have the vote happen here though. You guys are okay with that? Yep. Everybody's gotten there. Um, Got my feelings out. Yeah, everybody's it's expressed themselves. <laughs> Good. Let's have some cake. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Cool, that passes unanimously, unanimously, even though it's sort of half passing, half failing. Um, but the motion passes. So let's take a break. Wait, before we well, hold the second minute. motion. Oh, right, sorry, yeah, I'm sorry. I was gonna yeah. zoom ahead and thank you for reminding me. Did you any, have it right? Did you by any chance draft motion language on? I did not, but I, I do wanna mention that I think the types of regulation that would disincentivize condominiumizing this type of situation is just making it a lot more restrictive what can be done. I think some of the changes that were recently done to the ordinance would have much more disincentivized it when it was not a land, when it wasn't a, a use under the code, it was just a license um, that you know that could expire and had to be reapplied for if ownership changed um, when the occupancy standards were lower and so forth. So it's it's different things to be weighed. So my reading of um, the information that was shared with us was that um, there's enough, there, the opportunity exists and people have taken advantage of it, not just in Lyons, but in Littleton and I think Grand Junction was another place, but um, uh, that they are able to, um, uh, if they have the money, they can um, essentially create this HOA and condoize an ADU and once it's done, it's done. And um, Holly did offer up some of the examples of language that other towns have developed given their particular regulations. And I would, I would like, I think it's worth uh, presenting it to city council as a, a issue worth doing, asking staff, urging staff to do some research on and coming back to get us with a sense of has this been happening? Hasn't it been, has it not been happening? Um, so I don't know how, what the language would be, but. I think just making a motion that's, uh, we recommend city council research the potential of, um, I'm gonna make a motion that city, we planning board recommend to city council that they uh, research the potential of um, 
small uh, HOAs and county minimizations in the city of Boulder. Related to the ADU? Just well, in just general? in general. Like, you can research all of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can we, could, given that this was highlighted to us via the ADU reality, maybe just, um, and... Uh, was it though? Does it need to be limited? Well, because it won't, here's the, no, it doesn't need to be limited. I'm just, the, but here's the deal. Um, according to the material that was sent to us, we don't know, a city doesn't know if an, if an HOA has been created because it's not filed with the city, it's filed with the county. So it's one thing if someone comes in and says, I would like to create an HOA on my parcel of land. It's a totally different thing if someone creates an HOA and then it's a done deal and then somehow we find out about it because of however we find out about it. So that's, I'm just, I just think it's important to make sure that the possibility, that, that the city council understands that it's not just subdividing, not just subdivision. It's not subdivision at all, in fact. Or, um, excuse me, uh, that it's not, um, it, that it's, it, it, that this is, a, this was the specific concern that came up and it can fit into a broader conversation and exploration, but I just don't want that specific concern lost. So. So to continue we're in the process, does anyone have a second that motion I just made? So. And then you can make it friendly? Just to see if we can toddle our to, way through the process. To, to get it on. I'll okay, second. do you want to make it friendly to say especially as relating to ADUs? Fine, I, I thought we could just make it one piece of language, but if I need to apply, I have a friendly amendment, um, a friendly amendment that indicates the, um, uh, an interest in focusing on the, the possibility of ADUs uh, becoming uh, HOAs. I'm not sure how to say that language. Sure, that's a, I'd accept that. How about you, Armin? Sure. Close uh, enough? I think we want to, if, if we want to make it really specific, then I think John's language was, was the best. Um, you know, because what John said was that he was concerned about the abuse of condominium kind of minimization um, to turn houses and their ADUs into um, separate ownership units, basically to, to, to subdivide. Yeah. So is that what is that what we're yep. trying to get yep. at? That's what the what that's exactly what the email this? talks about. Yeah. Great. So Okay. Good. So maybe we should rephrase it. I will, will just withdraw my motion and you guys can Why don't we let John, John yeah. yeah. Okay. No, let's uh, use that language that you just Why don't you go ahead and make the motion. Yeah. Okay. I make that motion. <laughs> <laughs> is that good enough? Yeah. Okay, no. John, you gotta <laughs> okay. it's your baby, you gotta make the motion. I uh, the the board requests that uh, consideration be that the potential abuse of ADU, ADUs in Boulder be uh, to be turned into condominiums and effective subdivisions uh, be studied and considered. I'll second that. Cool. Does anyone want to speak to that? Okay, we'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Cool, that passes unanimously. Can't say that word tonight. Okay, let's take a five minute break and um, we'll come back and do the rest of this thing. Okay. <laughs> Just a matter of getting on. Hi. 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 I thought you, you phrased it. Hi.
<laughs> okay, we'll resume the, what is it, November 21st, I'm gonna say like May 19th, I know we're somewhere in the year, um, City of Boulder Planning Board meeting. We finished all our public hearing items and we have one matter from the staff to um, talk about the 2020 midterm update of the BVCP. Good evening, Chair and members of the Planning Board. I'm Jim Robertson, Comprehensive Planning Manager for the City of Boulder. Um, we're here tonight to give you a briefing, um, answer questions, <coughs> and get your feedback regarding the upcoming 2020 midterm update of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. I'm joined by my colleague, Jean Gatza, um, and Jean will be doing the presentation, and of course, after we'll entertain your questions during and or after um, we give you a short presentation. Shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Thank you, Jim, and good evening, um, members of the Planning Board. Um, I would will briefly touch on a few um, items, background, um, purpose, scope, process, and schedule of our um, upcoming midterm update to the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. Um, and this will include staff's initial thinking about the scope and topics to be addressed um, along with the schedule. So I will remind the board, as you well know, we have a rich history with our Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan and the uniqueness of the uh, intergovernmental agreement and cooperation um, and the, the co-adoption with our um, both the city and the county. Um, we're coming up on 2020, will be 40 years since the first um, adoption of the plan. So um, a very long and um, rich history, as I said. Um, I will mention at the last, you can see all the, the different points where we've done um, major updates and inter, or at least um, intergovernmental agreements. But I think there are a number of, um, we used to do annual updates and other midterm updates um, in between more of these years. So um, at the last major update to the comprehensive plan, I, there was a lot of support for moving to uh, the 10 year schedule for the major updates to make sure that we um, were making progress and actually implementing the plan in between the updates. It's only been about two years since we were in the throes of the major update and adopting it. Um, and I think there's, um, what you can see from the information provided in the action plan, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still quite a lot of work to do. Again, rich history with our intergovern intergovernmental agreement. Um, in adopting the plan and establishing um, really the importance and the agreement between the city and county to regulate, um, to implement and um, support these shared values that we have in the plan. At each update, we revisit, again, the question um, to extend that intergovernmental agreement um, another five years. So with this, I'd like to talk a little bit about the purpose of the midterm update. And I just wanna emphasize that this is indeed is about some housekeeping um, or making sure that our house is in order and not the wide um, breadth of topics that we typically address at the major update. So again, it's our opportunity to review progress on key objectives, um, provide that opportunity for the public request process, make our minor policy additions and clarifications as well as mapped changes to reflect um, annexations, open space, and other changes that have happened um, since the last update, but not intended to be a time to consider um, major policy changes. So this will keep us focused on housekeeping. Is that Mrs. Doubtfire? That is Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah, with that <laughs> one time rolled the <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Yeah. So. Great, um, charge of the 1977. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As you can see, um, there are a lot of different things that the comp plan outlines that we can change in the major in the midterm update. That doesn't mean we have to. Um, and we'll talk in a minute about the um, items that we've identified so far that um, we'll be ready to make some changes to update the policy um, direction that we've already adopted um, in, since the last major update. So subcommunity and area planning revisions, um, we will be able to include the Alpine Balsam area plan in the comp plan. Um, we have uh, several master plans that have been adopted 
um, since the last update, the transportation master plan and open space and mountain parks. <coughs> um, that and uh, your memo outlines a little bit more about there may be some policy changes that come from the process that is um, underway for the climate mobilization action plan. Um, we have some pretty strong um, climate and energy related policies, but there may be some tweaks that come out, come out of that process. And then depending on what it, um, what is proposed through the public request process, public application process, and other things that would, might be raised by the planning board or the city council. Um, there has been a couple, we've heard a couple of questions about the process for considering a service area expansion for the area three planning reserve. Um, and our, st our staff, so there is a, um, and we included um, some information, actually no, we didn't include information in the planning, this came up after the, um, the memo was ready. Um, there is a very specific process outlined in the comprehensive plan um, for um, the baseline urban services study and, and identification of unmet needs within the um, existing service area and then on to the initiation of a service area expansion plan. And so um, given those steps would take um, quite, a, quite a significant effort and, and time, um, we recommend that if there is interest, this is probably a, a, an item that the planning board and the city council can continue to talk about and consider, and should there be interest to initiate that baseline services study before the next major update in 2025. And so, um, again, the plan establishes um, the schedule and process for these updates in that um, the city and county staff will, will propose the process and schedule that will continue to refine with the feedback of the planning board and the city council. Um, we will do a public application screening, um, anticipating that in the first part of next year, and then um, the subsequent hearings, um, recommendations, and notification with uh, all the, the, the appropriate approval bodies. So city, city council and planning board for sure, and depending on the breadth of some of the changes um, with the planning commission and the um, board of county commissioners. Our proposed schedule would be, as I, as I mentioned, to finalize that scope and schedule and open the public request process in the first quarter of next year. Um, and then come back to the planning board, would be the planning board first to review that list of public application processes in a screening um, capacity. So we would we would do an analysis of does this meet the various criteria around um, does it um, the criteria is really around how much how much staff resources is it in compliance with um, the policies and um, direction of the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan for land use changes is it um, compatible with land with nearby land uses. Etc. So um, we'll do make a recommendation on an ini the initial screening, and then um, it will proceed through the four bodies to make sure that we've we're really working on things that make sense to work on, and not just working on things that um, we know aren't aren't in alignment with our vision and our uh, values and our comprehensive plan. And so then we would work through um, community engagement, depending on the the changes that would be proposed um, in the third quarter aiming to have an adoption but before the end of the year, um, next year, 2020. And with that, Jim and I are happy to take questions and um, hear your feedback on the scope, process, or schedule. Cool, thank you for the succinct presentation. Hopefully it'll be that way all the way through the process. Um, anybody have questions? That will depend on making sure that the scope <laughs> is scope. narrow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, anybody have questions on these three scope, process, schedule? Bits. Lupita? So one of the things that I would like to remind is in the community engagement, they have a very high priority on engaging the youth uh, and finding hopefully creative ways to make it very substantive in terms of just last night I was at a Ignite event at Fairview and all these young people were speaking about very important things within the city. It came out that many of them don't know that some of this stuff is happening, like the 15 men in walking neighborhoods, don't know. The young men that talk about that, so I told them a little bit about it. Uh, students talked about climate change. 
Uh, and so in any way that we can get that feedback from them and engage them, I would really like to, the city to do something like really, really innovative, like set the pace for the country, you know, just do it right. I would not to use the words of Boulder CEO, but just be bold, like really come out with something out of the ordinary. Just on that note, uh, Mayor Mincer from uh, Growing Up Boulder sent out a great um, guide. I'm sure you guys saw that as well. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. Other, and If I can say yeah. that we, we do partner with Growing Up Boulder and our Youth, uh, uh, youth Opportunities Advisory Board um, frequently for, for community engagement. Um, but we try to do that selectively to make sure that there are, they are of topics that are of, of interest um, to the youth, and we, um, I know for the last comp plan update, we worked with the, with YOAB and Growing Up Boulder um, in, a, in a number of different ways for that. For this, for this update, um, if there are really policy changes, then we would do that, then we would design engagement to do that. But for a lot of these changes, there are things that have already been through a process and have already been adopted. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't be things that we would um, really be actively looking for you know new ideas and feedback so we will we will make sure that we design that appropriately right and and it could be really about uh communicating okay so that they so the students the students and the young people feel that they understand what's going on and, and but more importantly is, is convey the message that we are thinking about them mm -hmm. i think that is so important right now this yep. generation really needs to feel the people the adults care about them and their future and, in this community yeah and the yes. future of the community that they are being thought about and and we need to articulate it even if we're not if we're doing it but we're not saying it <coughs> they're not they're not hearing it and we need to make sure that they hear it that's what my point is. Cool. John? Yeah, can you uh, describe uh, how, how the city will be working together with the county on this? Uh, has, has the county already designated individuals who will be involved and so on? Um, so far, you know, it, it, our, our planning staffs work closely together. So it will be um, Nicole Wobus from uh, the uh, land use, the long range land use staff um, and and again depending on the scope pulling in others and we've met, met with dale case as well so we will work closely with them um, uh, uh, on the initial turn of the screening process and then any uh, additional analysis um, of the ch of changes okay thank you mm -hmm. um the uh uh, the, the, the kinds of uh, changes that could come from the community or on land use, uh, uh, do you expect very many of those? And those would probably have to start fairly early on in the year's process, I would guess. So We know of a handful of folks that are interested um, okay. in, in changes, you know, the small changes, small parcels, the here and there types of things that um, would be ext um, an extensive process and expensive for them to do. As, par as a one-off, not part of the updates. Mm -hmm. So we know of a few of those that might consider, um, but not not like lots and lots. Not of a them. huge number. I know every once in a while in planning board we see, oh, is this right? You know, like a boundary or something like that. I don't know if we should go, be going back and looking at those and calling them to your attention or uh, if they would be, or maybe that's something for the major revision. I don't know. Hmm. Like. Uh, yeah. yeah, I would. I mean, my thought is, if 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 you, David, or or any member of the of the board was aware of particular, you know, sort of housekeeping type things, if you will, boundary changes and things like that, um, okay. this is certainly an opportunity to do that. Um, I think where it would cross the line and perhaps be more appropriate for a major update would be if somehow that that reflects an underlying policy debate um, yeah. or triggers an underlying policy debate. But if it's a simple cleanup item, and in other words, we've become aware over the recent years through cases that have come before you or something like that of some weird boundary issues or things like that, I, we'd be happy to know that. Okay. Well, we certainly have had cleanup items 
it became debates, like you know the OSO, OSO which is, is the perfect example yeah. of what should should you know what appears to be a cleanup item when it's in the yeah. Liquor Mart parking yeah. lot, and then it becomes a policy debate. Yeah, in my yeah. head, but I didn't say it. But I think that's an example <laughs> of really something that's probably more appropriate for mm -hmm. a, 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 major, a ten year major update. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> another one that I remember. I'm sorry. I'll just quickly finish the, that one. Uh, is that um, there was a portion, I think, of Broadway that was all was zoned for uh, a, cer a certain type of uh, storefront, except for one little area, and I thought, and um, that probably would potentially create policy debate, so we'd probably have to think about it, but mm. anyway. Go ahead, Peter, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Did I, did no, I cut you off? No. <laughs> no, 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 you kept me from wasting time, which I'm doing now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other comments for these guys, or should we let them go to bed? Um, are we allowed to give feedback on the content of your memo? Okay, because it, it, you had sure. scope, process, Mic and on. schedule. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so I just had some feedback on the, the content of the memo. Um, I just I wanted to point out that um, at our retreat, we discussed the value of um, doing a, um, an assessment of TVAP stage one implementation before uh, applying, in order to figure out lessons learned and applying, trying to uh, figure out if they needed to be applied to TVAP stage two. I just wanted to remind all of us that that was something we discussed. Um, and then um, uh, you have um, one of your items prioritizing other future area plans. And I was just thinking that um, based on the letter that we are sending to city council that maybe we want to put um, diagonal plaza as the first rather than the fifth on that list. Um, uh, and then I, I, everything else is, it sounds like it's not meant for this um, type of update. So I will hold off on all that stuff. Yep, speak to Roxanne. Okay. You know, I, I guess I would just say that when we were talking about the schedule for, for updates, um, there were folks who were, you know, talking about like five year major update, two and a half year midterm updates. And I was sitting here going, you know, I was the only person at, on this planning board who's actually done a comprehensive plan update as the chief planner handling the update. I think you're nuts. I think doing a major update every five years is just planning all the time. Yeah. And I so I'm that's glad we that we're doing it on a 10-year schedule. Yeah. I think I had probably proposed a 12-year schedule and settled for 10 because it isn't, I'm not king of the world. I don't get to make the call. But I do want to point out that we just finished, you know, a year and a half ago, we just finished the comp plan update. And we're talking about scoping the midterm update in two months, starting in two months. So, you know, again, I'm putting this out there that we're jumping from one plan to the next, to the next, to the next. And, you know, at some point, um, maybe going out to a, like a 15 year schedule with a seven and a half year midterm update, you know, would be okay because it sounds fine when you say, well, it's a 10 year major update schedule, but since the plan takes three years to get across the finish line, it's really only seven years from when you finish the last one until you start the next one. And in the middle of that, you're doing a midterm update, which takes a couple of years. So you're really doing comprehensive planning for five out of every 10 years. And it doesn't leave as much time for, you know, really implementing the, the goals of the plan. And, and while I think that it, we, we run the risk if you, if you do the update cycles too far apart, you run the risk of getting a calcified plan that sits on a shelf that nobody reads. And I love the fact that Boulder's always reading its comprehensive plan better than any place I've ever been. Um, but, but you have to walk that fine line between are we just planning all the time and forgetting to you know, really implement what we plan for and celebrate what we accomplished and learn to you know, love what we created um, you know, on the one side and, um, you know, 
are we forgetting to plan as much as we should on the other side? And I still think, you know, the, this kind of hit me as a slap in the face. God darn it, we're already talking about the midterm update. Um, you know, I spent the first three years on planning board doing the first plan, and now I'm going to spend my last year. So it's four of the five years I'm going to be on planning board, we're going to be doing comp plan updates. And, and I think that that's still too much. That's my editorial comment, but I will support you 100% through the process. Well, I appreciate that. John, you want to get in there? Yeah, well, uh, I, I have to say I certainly sympathize with you as someone who's been involved with four of these things, either mm -hmm. for the county or for the city. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that you stressed the, the housekeeping element of this. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was very effectively done and very, very appropriate. Yeah, please keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> we have your permission to remind you of that? You do. We have our encouragement to remind us of that. Um, any other things yeah. we want to get off our chests? We're good? Don't be the winner of the golden broom by staff. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, moving on. Wow. Okay, so planning board letter to city council. <coughs> um, I think everybody did a fantastic job um, staying succinct and being clear. Um, it's totally cool to have this thing be like a page and a half. Um, does anyone have anything in there? And I basically didn't make any changes other than like formatting things as we put in there, except for I did add one word, I think under resilience. Yes, under resilience, I added the word education to your first, to your paragraph. I'm with that. Cool, hopefully I didn't overstep <laughs> you really rewrote it. I did rewrite the whole thing and I changed the intent. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I did it out of uh, selfish motives. Yeah. No, out of spite. <laughs> Can I just ask a question about yeah. how, uh, how these letters are used? I mean, I've sat through um, a couple of city uh, council uh, retreats, so I know that the letters are looked at and reviewed. Um, but uh, the question I have is how useful is it to be explicit, um, and here I'm speaking specifically about the, loc and we talked about this earlier, the location of um, opportunities to add rent and renters into the language. Do, would it be helpful to city council to be explicit about where they could make that kind of change, ling linguistic or legislative language change, or is this, is, is this the best we're gonna, the best we can do? I am honestly not sure how to answer your question. Um, well, you put in your um, your input a section reference, uh, which uh, for a specific thing for the, <laughs> the renter noticing is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah. So what the the uh, initial in, uh, language I brought had specific language, um, and it's it's not in it, it, it is referenced, but we don't give them a specific example of where they could make that change. And it may not be valuable to do that, but I'm just wondering, given that um, I've heard, uh, I heard Brian mention that we've tried this before and nothing, there were no changes and perhaps- You're talking about notification to renters yeah, as well? Just okay, just explain, because I'm totally not sure what you're talking about. It's in there. Okay, I'm, just, I'm not following which section you're talking about or anything, so. In, the, uh, in, in community the, engagement, um, it's just that we don't specifically. Okay, cool. Sorry, I just have no idea where we're at. So um, can I, yeah, because I wrote that part and Sarah had put in the, um, had a fairly um, extensive write-up where she uh, identified the place in the code that says that homeowners or, or, or landowners are notified for, but it property doesn't, owners. property owners, but not, but, not, uh, but it doesn't uh, include renters. And so I tried to get to that, but I didn't, I didn't bring over the reference to the actual code thing because I figured, I, don't, I didn't know if we wanted to put uh, things that would, I mean, if the initiative's created, then you're gonna identify where you wanna do it and people can find that. But, um, and so I thought it was maybe too detailed, but if we wanna I, consider just, putting it right, in. I'm can. just asking the question whether, yeah. given that we've tried this before and it has not made a difference, whether if we were very specific and referenced the specific code, it might, 
create um, a little bit more momentum? That's just my only question. Cool. Thank you guys for helping me figure out what you were talking about. I wasn't. Yeah. I was not clear at all. So let's go back to your thing. I wasn't sure if I should put that in or not. <laughs> well, I know we want to keep yeah. the letter short and I was, sweet. I thought it would get a little uh, complicated, and then I wasn't sure if we knew every place that renters would need to. So I thought maybe we would leave That's it a little fair. more general. That's but fair. I, I just I was really asking the question more yeah. than making it making a recommendation. Yeah, I, I think I think we've gone on record here, and okay, that that's appropriate. Any other thoughts on it? Well, I was just thinking the the input that you gave is part of the public record, and you know, we could uh, we could, we could. I think actually it might be in those minutes from our meeting, but we could make sure that that's in the minutes if they're not in there yet okay. too. I'll double check. Yeah, and at least then it's kind of on record because I think it was good that you did all that research into where it could be changed. Cool. I'm super glad we have that in there. And I, I definitely, you know, I am sort of surprised that we've gotten nowhere with it and I want us to get somewhere with it, so. Appreciate us all kind of like focusing on that because it's, it's well, a little bit surprising to me that it's I do have my form been difficult. I, <laughs> it seems like it should have been super easy. Yeah, and we've said it like a hundred times in meetings, right? Yeah, it seems so, so. fundamental that. Uh, okay, hold on. I, let me just get to my old language. It's surprising. Yeah. Um, oh, wait, that's my application. It's not right. City council letter. Yeah, it notes. Um, I'll find it just when you do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, there's just a, we could maybe do it as a footnote, an end note, um, and it's just the language I had in the notes I sent to you all was um, expand public notification of development projects to include all residential and commercial renters within 600 feet of a proposed project. The solution to this challenge would be to add and renters to all BRC 9-4-3 public notice requirements. Um, the language, the new language would read, quote, to property owners and renters, dot, dot, dot. Um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not lovely writing, but it does, um, it is pretty specific. I'm ambivalent. I wouldn't fight it or, uh, I mean, sort of. If that were just put in a footnote to that little thing is, you know, I, uh, I think that's. So that's a great idea. In my that's mind, fine. I said that, yeah. and the reason why I think it's a great idea is because it's so wonky and specific that to go in the you know these lead place. paragraphs just looks like weird. But if we put it at the bottom as a footnote, that would draw extra attention to that last sentence about engagement mechanisms, mm -hmm. and I like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. cool. So to I'm down with that. To whom do I do I send this Cindy. language to you for a, for okay. Oh, really? Okay. We aren't changing anything yet, but what this would be, Cindy, is just in the first paragraph, there's a one and two underneath it, one for equity and one for community engagement, and this would just be a asterisk at the end of the community engagement paragraph, and then that would just be a footnote. I'm sending it to you again, Cindy, in a word. Perfect. Oh, are you, so do you not meet? Right. Oh, you don't meet? You, okay. I can do it. Okay. Do you, do you have that language, Brian? No. Uh, I don't. If you just, I have that language. Cool. So just okay. email it to me and I'll put it in there. Okay. Then you'll get the whole thing. Okay. Perfect. That's perfect. Great. Brian Bowen. Okay. okay. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I think it'll be, I hope it'll be, make it possible to make this happen. Mm hmm Cool. Um, no other changes? We're all good on the, I mean, it seemed like it was a pretty elegantly drafted yeah. deal, so. Header. <laughs> so, I think we're in housing in the second sentence. I'm just trying to, it's a long and many clause sentence. Escalating home prices limit housing opportunities for low, moderate, middle-income households that, in turn, 
inhibits. I think that should be inhibit. Because we're either talking about escalating home prices or limiting housing opportunities. Okay. People agree with that? We're parsing that language. Yes, yeah, the, the wrong now. derby. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I think that's right. Okay. That's only knit I have to pick. Only one knit? Just one pretty amazing. <laughs> I had wow. 16 Just last year. Knit. <laughs> you have not earned your dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Give it back. <laughs> uh, okay. I'll add Sarah's footnote, and I'll add take away Harmon's S, and I think we're in good shape. Wow. Well done. Planning good board. job, wow. guys. So I'll send this off. The shortest letter. Yep. Finished the earliest. The best letter in our best. careers. Ever. I, I got to tell you, I was at RAB on Monday night. Uh -huh. They don't even know how to spell over there. Thing. Hmm? <laughs> they are bringing in a facilitator to. <laughs> oh my God. You guys are it's my a lot best. Of work for that because they're a bunch of engineers, and when it comes no, to writing, they they're just not engineers. They're attorneys mostly. No, that's oh the worst. God. You're my wow. best board. You're the first one done. Yeah. We're the first ones done. We're the best board of all time. And, and yeah, we were at Hab yesterday, and that one was a little bit more harder than this one. So. Maybe they didn't have whiteboard sessions like we did. <laughs> <laughs> I've used you as an example. My All right. I think having Just a use that picture of me writing the marker on the board, like I three of you guys sent. <laughs> this is actually the second year in a row that we've had one of those drafting sessions, yeah. um, and we didn't have a full. Every, this year we had everybody, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's worked pretty well both times. Yeah. It might I think it helps to contextualize the comments, you know, because I think what we've had as a problem in the past is like two or three people would like take off and write extensively and separately about something. So they'd all come back with like three to five page <laughs> yeah. memoirs, right? Oof. And then you're like, oh, how do we, Brutal. and then it's an affront to take away anything that they've written so carefully. It's, it's That's a good lesson learned. And then the other thing I think is just that at the end of these meetings, we're just too overwhelmed and muddled to be able to be productive. So having a special time where we go to it. Yeah, if we had to kick that conversation off now, I'd be, you'd um, be like, oh, yeah. I'd be breaking up with my planning exactly. board cyanide tooth. Do you have one of those? I do, yeah. Before we cut off, if we, I wanted to just bring one one item um, that we discussed earlier, but I just wanted to remind you, I did get um, for that bias training that we talked about and the request sure, to yeah. the city. So I checked on campus, and we do have some facilities. I talked to Chris also. He was going to look into what the city has to offer. But there is a group um, and uh, called National Center for Women in Information Technology. They do implicit bias workshops, and they do it within campus and outside campus. I mentioned uh, this to Hella, and she said, you know, maybe a good thing also that we can look at to potentially expand to other boards. So I just wanted to let mm -hmm. you know that we do have some uh, alternatives if the cool. city doesn't have anything available, and if we can kind of uh, make a recommendation that we get it scheduled. Sure. Um, yeah, send it to me. We can sit down and talk about it. So I think I'd suggest that we sit down with Chris to talk about this stuff. But if we wanted yeah, to, yeah, because it's it fine. I know it came as I asked you, you know, about the travel. Yeah. But uh, definitely, that was what I wanted to at least have this thing moving, and then we have some resources to work with. Cool. Speaking of NC Wit. Um, oh, you know them. Look, yeah, yeah. Never. There's a movie uh, my friend made that I'm an advisor on called Bias, that you should watch. It's a great movie. Her first movie was Code Debugging the Gender Gap, which is also amazing. Cool. And uh, bias is uh, covers this topic of unconscious bias. And also, you'd love the movie. You should email the link S to it. I will. Send us the link, and I'm going to send this, uh, this info. Yeah, please do. And then um, one other thing along sort of similar lines, like I took the city's um, communication skills training three-day workshop last week, which is a f Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, um, out of the newly renovated um, county open space, or city open space offices in, on 55th or whatever it is. Um, and it was great. It was really useful. Um, and, uh, and I know every time I've talked to a s different city staff person about it, they always are like, yeah, that was great. And so it's been interesting to me to see that sort of mm. get corroborated across different mm. work groups and different things. Like Cindy's nodding up and down saying it's a good idea. So. Um, and I actually, it was, it was interesting for me because I ended up knowing 
uh, well, Mark Gerwing was in there, who's an architect who'd been on uh, Landmark Advisory Board for a long time. He's a really good guy. Married Marcy Cameron recently. Um, and then, yeah, for real. Yeah, totally cool, huh? Um, and then um, Connor Merrigan, who used to work for, or intern for BHP during the holiday process, was there. Um, the ED from Coho US, the Cozing Association of the US, was there. Um, and uh, a builder I worked with. So I like knew all these people in the room already, which is kind of amazing. And then everybody got a ton out of it, actually. It seemed like it got really good reviews across the board. And three days is a long time, but um, it was worth it. And so uh, when we walked out of that training, the trainer said, like, okay, well, we've got um, a scheduled training in January 14th through 16th. Mm -hmm. And the venue that we had planned um, pooped out. So they, they didn't have a venue for it. And I said, well, I'll host it. So we're going to host it at Wild Sage, which you guys have all, I think, pretty much been to the common house there. So we're going to we're gonna be the host for a three-day-long communication training. Um, Good on you. Yeah, and I wanted to encourage you guys um, all to come. It's three days, but it's... When is this? It's uh, January, January 14th, 15th, and 16th. So it's week. It's the middle of a week. So it's not weekday, right? not weekends. It doesn't take away from your actual family life. It just hoses your work schedule. Um, so MLK weekend must be really How, like this year. What is the procedure so, to uh, sign up for? Uh, I, I'll email you guys the link. You kind of um, start thinking. I don't have three days, but the three days fly by, and you really you learn a lot, and you it's intense, but it's it's fun at the same time, and, mm -hmm. and it's really a great it's a great mm -hmm. training. I, I call it training, but yeah. you really do learn a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's super fantastic, yeah. and there's like the time flew by. The kind of role playing that you do, because there is some role playing, is a kind of role playing that even a guy like me was comfortable with. So, mm -hmm. pretty tolerable role playing, um, and uh, the skills were pretty concrete. So, um, that was pretty useful. And there's also it's part of like a DISC training system, D I S C. So there's like a personality test part of it. Which is actually pretty interesting because then. What are you? Dude, uh, he's definitely. Say, don't not say that on TV. Yeah. People are the, secret. The, the, the I people or the D people are going to be calling you up. Totally. You got to watch yeah. the D people. They're you got to watch the D people. So, is there a charge for this? There is. So, I think that the way it was structured when I took it, and I think this is the way this one will be structured, is that I think the training usually costs like $2,000 per person or something crazy like that, but they offer a sliding scale from $35 to a couple hundred or something like that. And I think that's partially, I think some of that would go back to help pay for the food because they, you know, there's like coffee and stuff in the break in the morning and then Lunch. they provide your lunches. Um, and uh, we would probably, when we put it on, we'll be responsible for putting together lunches. So I'm going to get help from that, somebody in my office for that. Um, and we'll probably like do a theme of like, like local neighborhood stuff. So like one day we'd be like Proto's Pizza, stuff like that. Uh, it'd be kind of cool to do it a little neighborhoody. Um, so I'm kind of I'm kind of psyched about it, um, yeah. and uh, I don't know it's cool. So awesome. nice, yeah. I'm a high S. Just so. mm, okay. So what are the choices? What's the D I S. Choices? Yeah, so it's it's really pretty interesting. Like D is more about really like directing and controlling things, right? I is really like all heart. S is people who are motivated by a higher purpose, which like yes. when I. Yeah. And C are the sort of analytical people, if I remember right. Not me. So what were you? Do you remember where you were? I don't remember. I think uh, I was a D. Dominance, like, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness. There you go. And then you can be like ID or SC. Or, uh, I yeah. might have been an So I meant S SC in certain environments and SI in different environments. I, I don't remember. And I thought like I was going to be like all heart, um, and then which I'm sure you guys are all like, <laughs> just in like the way like the inner workings are you know um, we're more discreet yeah but uh, it turned out it was like all higher purpose and I was like oh totally that's exactly right like I will throw down if it's the right thing to do I think I was all heart person. Uh, that's what I would have guessed mm. <laughs> so it's cool I, and there's like there's some cool introspective learning that goes along with it too right not just like um, how do you act to listen like oh you smile at Harmon not oh yeah really <laughs> oh, okay cool great um, there's some stuff that you're like, yeah, I got it. But other things were really useful. So I thought it was cool. Mm -hmm. So I'll extend an invitation to you guys for that. 
Um, it's totally worth spending the three days. Great. Just want a quick calendar check. We do have a meeting on December 5th. Um, but, and um, don't get your hopes up that there is a 90% chance we will not have a meeting on December 19th. So very likely. That would be pretty nice to know. So, that. yeah. What's the agenda on the 5th? Uh, we have a concept plan for 2400 Central Avenue. I don't know what that is. Oh, but yeah. that, the packet's going out tomorrow. Yeah. And right now, as of now, we don't have any agenda items for the 19th of December. So. Let's just say it's not gonna happen. I would love to say that You're for sure, but I'm 90% sure. Oh, don't forget to gavel. Can I, yep, can I ask something before yep. we gavel? Yep. Um, uh, I don't know if we're ever asked to uh, give the city council input on the legislative agenda for the city. Um, They've never asked us that, but I think as a planning board member, if you wanted to weigh in on that, that's totally appropriate. Okay, so I just thought I'd ask that question because um, as we have looked at affordable housing, I think that there are a number of state laws that get in the way of us having the tools at our disposal. And I don't see on the legislative agenda, I don't know how influential those things are, that the city of Boulder is asking for a currently friendly state house and governor's office to actually look at some of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I'd also love to see us look at local progressive taxation, but that's another issue that's probably not planning board related, but but yeah, I mean, specifically affordable housing, I feel like um, there's some state regulations that make it more difficult for us. So right. um, I'm just curious about that. So. I mean, I would, just speaking for myself, I would totally support you writing a message about that from the planning board if everyone f feels comfortable with that. I think HAP was interested potentially in that too when I brought it up. Well, but, yeah. so at city council on Tuesday, they actually went through the Low, yeah, the, was, yeah and they there. they um, on the state and federal legislation, and um, there were at le there was at least one affordable housing, um, a state based uh, likely piece of legislation in the state house, which has to do with allowing uh, on site uh, affordable rentals and rental in rental buildings. Yeah, that's. Um, and there is a separate. Um, proposal that's likely to come up, which is about rent control, but it is a separate piece of, it'll okay. be a separate piece of legislation. Um, and those were the two that they mentioned. Um, and I don't think the city council, uh, I think the only thing the city council responded to was the um, the one about the on-site affordable rentals. Yeah. Well, those are two of the big ones, mm -hmm. so, okay. Thank you, I'll, I'll see about maybe writing something that I'll say. So, you know, David, I, I guess um, I just echo Brian. If you wanted to write something up and put it on the agenda for, for us to review or if it can be distributed in some way um, that we can then comment on in public, um, you know, I think, I think I without good. overly wordsmithing it, I, I'd probably be comfortable just signing on and you could represent that as being, you know, the thoughts of planning board or the recommendation of planning board. And then if you wanted to further, you know, go to the council and make public comment, in your own personal capacity, you could direct them to your letter, yeah, say that that is from planning board, but you have additional thoughts that are from you, David Ensign, yourself about the taxation issue or whatever else you wanna talk about. Okay, that sounds good, yeah. Let me uh, take that on. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Um, any other things before we wrap it up? Cool, thanks everybody. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.